Hey, good evening. I'm Carolyn Rye, Chair of the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach, and I hereby call this meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. on this 25th day of August 2020. Pursuant to the state of emergency related to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Governor's Executive Orders, the Freedom, Virginia Freedom of Information Act, as amended by the Virginia General Assembly, and the School Board's April 7, 2020 emergency resolution, the school board and selected staff members will meet in person at the school administration building. However, at this time, it's impractical and unsafe to allow other persons to attend the school board meeting due to physical distancing and safety precautions related to the pandemic. Members of the public will be able to observe the school board meeting through live streaming on vbschools.com, broadcast on VBTV channel 47 and on Zoom. And we do welcome our listening public. For tonight's meeting, Ms. Owens is participating re remotely from Virginia Beach, and Mrs. Weems is participating remotely from out of state. She is local and she is on the Zoom call. Thank you. So now, Madam Clerk, uh, uh, if you may, if I can ask you to uh, do the verbal roll call. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the school board chambers is Ms. Hughes, Ms. Manning, Ms. Felton, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Melnick, Ms. Rye, Mr. Edwards, Ms. Holtz, Ms. Riggs, and participating via Zoom is Ms. Owens and Ms. Weems. Thank you. Please join now in uh, observing a moment of silence. And please stand as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Dr. Spence, we now look forward to your superintendent report. Thank you, and good evening, Madam Chairwoman and members of the board. Here are just a few items of interest for you and for our families to know on this August 25th. Uh, first, Virginia Beach City Public Schools Teacher Orientation 2020 has been underway since July and continues throughout this week as we work towards our first day of school on September the 8th. As of today, almost 350 teachers have joined the school division from Hampton Roads, around the state, throughout the country, and as far away as Honduras, Italy, and Turkey. A variety of sessions have been offered in July and August, with many concluding this week, each one aimed at equipping teachers for a successful school year. Through these orientation sessions, teachers new to teaching as well as veteran educators who are new to VB schools are introduced to their specific curriculum, resources and supports including technology platforms and tools that you've heard about this evening and expectations for teaching planning assessment and the learning environment at the schools activities have been organized so that teachers can meet colleagues and learn about their buildings resources so we'd like to heartily welcome our new colleagues and we want to say that we're thrilled they've chosen to become part of our vbcps family we're looking forward to working together throughout this year as we focus on the division's goal of meeting the needs of every student every day in whatever shape that takes. Second, the division's VB Safe Together five-part information series is in full swing as we get ready to launch week four session covering some of the most requested questions related to safety mitigations in our schools and classrooms. This session will be led by Mr. Jack Freeman as he shows how several school-based activities will take place including cleaning protocols, transportation service, and more. This session's Zoom information can be found on the division's Fall 2020 plan page on vbschools.com. And as a reminder, all of our information sessions are recorded and posted on the division's YouTube channel and vbschools.com. And finally, third, in sustainability news, crews with SunTribe Solar are, as we speak, installing solar arrays on the rooftops of Renaissance Academy, Ocean Lakes Elementary, 
Thurgood Elementary and the new Princess Anne Middle School, which is currently being built. And the array at Ocean Lakes could provide up to 100% of the school's energy needs, making it the first net zero building in the school division. These new installations will save the division about $4.2 million over the next 25 years and will help to achieve some of the division's goals, which include reducing the division's greenhouse gas emissions by 70% by 2030. I want to thank Mr. Jack Freeman and Mr. Tim Cole and all of their teams for making this work possible. Thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Spence. Okay, hearing of citizens and delegations on agenda items. The school board will now hear comments on agenda items from citizens and delegations who signed up with our clerk prior to this meeting. In-person speakers will be called first, followed by speakers participating through Zoom or telephone. It's not necessary for speakers to ask if they can be heard. Speakers should begin speaking once their name is called. As a reminder, each speaker has four minutes to present and will be given a 30-second warning before time expires. Once the speaker's time has expired, the next speaker will be queued to speak. Please keep in, in mind the school board invites the public to also submit comments through our group email account, which can be found on our website. So with that, Madam Clerk, would you announce the first speaker, please? Thank you. Our first speaker this evening is Sarah Catherine Kebler. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you all for having me speak. I'm Sarah Catherine Kibler. Um, I am the mother of John Kibler, who is a rising senior at Prince Stan High School in the IB Diploma Program. Um, I have two other children, um, both who graduated from IB Diploma Programs. One at Princess Anne um, in 2018, and the other um, in Atlanta, where we lived before we moved um, to Virginia Beach. So I sent an email on August 13th that outlined my concerns about the 4x4 high school structure and how it would impact the IB diploma candidates going into um, 11th and 12th grade specifically. And I don't plan to repeat um, that in the contents of that letter, but I did want to come and speak to you tonight and um, just in support of the specific needs of the IB Diploma Program and, um, the, and the IB Diploma Program candidates at Princess Anne and express my concern that the four by four plan that y'all have set in place is really not gonna work for that program. The requirements of the IB Diploma, IB Diploma Program are very specific and they are different and it's often confusing and so that's why I sent my letter because I wasn't certain that the board understood the specifics of the IB Diploma Program and the, different, the difference between that and AP and Honors Program and a traditional high school um, curriculum. So I um, respectfully ask that the Virginia Beach City Public School give flexibility for the Princess Anne High School IB Diploma Program Academy to plan their courses outside of the four by four schedule as needed. And I ask you consider the needs of the rising seniors and the juniors in the IB Diploma Program and allow them to work to qualify for that IB Diploma that they've worked so hard for for so many years. And then additionally, I ask that you provide the Diploma Program at Princess Anne, the administrators, the full support of the board and all the administration so that they can support the candidates. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cheryl Turpin. Speaker number two has not checked in yet. Madam Clerk. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Tanya Rivers. Welcome. Good evening. I have two children in the Virginia Beach City Public School System. One is in first grade and one is in third grade in two different elementary schools. I'm here to discuss the fall 2020 school plan. Over the course of the last few weeks since the plan has been announced, I've had many discussions with parents. Many believed that the first nine weeks of school be virtual because that's what other school systems are doing. And they said they would have changed to option two if they had known. Others were concerned about losing services their children needed if they chose for option two, so they went with option one. 
In short, the plan has caused much confusion for everyone. For parents, the fear of losing their home school and services that they need, for teachers, the stress about being moved to different schools or grade levels, and the staff having to assume roles they are not trained for are common concerns. The role and structure of the VLC is ever changing as well. At the last meeting, it was said that the plan cannot change without another survey being sent to parents. Well, the plan has changed and changing without information being made transparent to everyone. Given the new information about the VLC, many parents said they would have changed their option if that meant they would stay at their home school. I have heard many heartbreaking stories from teachers leaving their profession that they love because they feel they are not getting the respect that they deserve, but instead are being used as pawns in a chessboard to suit the needs of others. The mental health of students is, of course, the utmost importance. But what about teachers and staff? The uncertainty of option one and the possibility of yo-yoing between virtual and face-to-face -face causes undue stress and anxiety for everyone. Virginia Beach City Public Schools is innovative in its approach to learning and is well poised for virtual learning. Connections can still be made through a virtual platform and rigorous inquiry-based learning can be equitable and differentiated to meet the needs of all students. I propose having the first nine weeks of school virtual for everyone and re-examining the metrics each quarter, returning face-to-face -face when we are in the green zone only. With this, you can limit the amount of confusion that is rampant among the district. Nine weeks is not an arbitrary number. Nine weeks is a period of time that everyone can use to plan ahead, a known and a constant. They can use that time to plan for childcare if needed or to focus on enriching the virtual learning environment. A set time that teachers do not have to worry about the metrics or the colors and where they're te teaching from in a couple of weeks. Nine weeks will allow more time to ensure all the necessary PPE and precautionary measures are in place at every school. Nine weeks will allow time to see if there's truly a downward trend in cases or if it's a temporary or if it's temporary due to a reporting issues and testing limitations. This is a marathon, not a race. There are no awards handed out to the school district for those that have the least amount of cases. This is a time to be safe. I know there is no guarantee children will be 100% safe at schools, but this is not a tornado or an active shooter. We know there's a virus out there. We know that millions of people are getting sick, including children. We know that tens of thousands have died already. By opening two schools too soon, you're inviting a threat in instead of protecting staff and students from it. Until community spread is controlled, it is inevitable that the virus will find its way into schools. Even with mask mandates, you are seeing colleges and 30 schools seconds. being closed down. They are only as effective as a community that adheres to it. And around here, I can tell you not many adhere to it. The pandemic is a fluid situation and therefore the plan must be fluid and change as needed. Just because a plan changes does not make it wrong. It means you're adapting to an ever-changing situation. I urge you to consider making the first nine weeks online, only have the students return face-to-face -face when the metrics are in the green zone and reevaluating each quarter. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Isabel Henson. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. I am so grateful for the opportunity to speak to you all. My name is Isabel Henson and I am now a senior at the diploma program at Princess Anne High School. I want to talk to you about IB. IB is not just a Virginia Beach Academy, but an internationally accredited world organization with schools located in 156 different countries around the world. As such, the diploma program at PA is subject not only to the regulations and requirements of Virginia Beach and the state of Virginia, but to those of IB itself. Thus, the proposed 4 by 4 plan would have a profound impact on our IB population. A critical part of the diploma program is the internal assessment, or IA, which must be completed for each class. IAs are curriculum embedded evaluations of student learning which account for 20 to 25 percent of each student's final exam grade. IAs are investigations which require a comprehensive knowledge and subsequent analysis of the entirety of each class's course material. In the event of a normal unabbreviated school year, students have had their entire year of AB scheduling to study all course material over seven months with time both to complete IAs and prepare adequately for exams. 
It's also important to note that, that the diploma program classes may be either standard level or higher level. And IB requires that at least three of the six classes, sub, the subjects required for the IB diploma, there are six, must be higher level. Most higher level classes span over the course of both 11th and 12th grade, in other words, the entirety of the diploma program. However, since many students never finished year one due to last spring's school closure, teachers this year will be responsible for both recovering lost material from last spring and teaching all course material for year two, getting students through IAs, and getting students adequately prepared for their IB exams. In term one, this would account for nearly double the amount of material usually covered in only half of the time. Students in the second term would be at an even greater disadvantage. The due dates of IAs and the scheduling of exams are all determined by IB and will not change. Thus, second term students would be responsible for learning up to two years worth of material and having enough time to plan and execute their IAs. And, I'm sorry, and um, teachers need time to grade and provide commentary based on the IB rubric for each individual student. Meaning that all IAs must be uploaded to IB before the due date of April 15th, but the due dates for individual teachers will be much earlier because they have to grade each and every IA before it is submitted. IB has made concessions by removing some of the content requirements from exams but regardless of this and anything else anyone can think of to help get us through IAs and exams in the second term, we would be expected to spend many extra hours, potentially on Mondays or weekends, working throughout term one, two terms in one session, in order to make it work. 30 seconds. I have to ask you, how would this reduce teacher and student stress? Who would be responsible if we were to fail and not receive our IB diplomas? We have invested years of effort and passion into this program. We accept that this situation is beyond the norm, but adding a 4x4 plan into the equation is unreasonable. I urge you to consider a hybrid AB schedule, as this plan is simply not conducive to IB. This program means the world to my peers and I. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Our next speaker is Kimberly Henson. Welcome. I'm the mom of her. I don't speak like her, so don't get excited. But um, since IB is an international program, it has preset assessment and exam dates for everyone in the world. They're not just going to change for Virginia Beach City Public Schools. So when the kids figured this out, Izzy actually had to show me because I'm a visual person. So this is term one. And I did it based on the school calendar and the learning plan, so there were no Mondays. So term one gets 73 days to learn the rest of last year, learn this year, do their internal assessment, and get ready for an exam in term two, which is this. 35 days to do the same amount of work. And I just ask you, you know, how is that equitable? How is that equitable to our 250 kids that we're talking about? Um, term two will have 75 days, but the IA is due to International Baccalaureate on the 38th day. And that's something they have to learn the content before they can apply it to their, inter, you know, their um, assessment, their IA. <clears throat> so how will I expect my daughter to be able to control her anxiety and stress? not to mention applying to college and scholarships. I implore you to give a second look at the need for continuity across all of VBCPS seniors, to familiar, familiarize yourself with IB, DP, and consider a hybrid four by four with A and B days to give students in the IB DP the best possible scenario. They deserve it. Thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tracy Ligwin. Welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your service during this difficult time. Um, 
My name is Tracy Leagid, and I am uh, I will be the um, on-site sub at Windsor Woods Elementary School in the upcoming school year, and I'm pursuing my third career in special ed elementary. Um, let's see. I appreciate your commitment to monitoring to monitoring air quality. Um, could you offer more details on what this looks like? Will these measurements be made public? Example, humidity measurements. Um, also, um, are basic classroom guidelines being developed to ensure maximum airflow or to ensure fresh air? For example, requiring windows to be open at all or specific times or ensuring accommodations are made for students and staff with breathing issues. Um, and also, what is the plan for windowless classrooms or spaces? I know this is a huge concern. Um, let's see. Um, and considering that these issues are potentially up in the air, I'd like to advocate or continue to advocate for the first nine weeks of school to be virtual as we hash out these critical details. Um, okay. And uh, thank you all uh, for everyone who's masking appropriately. That is very awesome. Um, currently, I'm tutoring a rising second grader, and part of his curriculum is personal health advocacy. So part of his being a good student is obviously to be a part of a safe environment or to ensure a safe environment like all teachers and staff do. So he will be taught if he sees something to say something. So for example, if he walks into his classroom and the windows are never open, when we are physically in school, he'll say, hey, can we open the window, teacher? Or if someone is chronically not masking, um, who doesn't obviously have a health or a medical issue, um, he will ask them to mask or, or tell the teacher, or if it's the teacher, to um, talk to his assistant principal. Um, and that's it. Uh, thank you all again for your hard work. I know this is incredibly difficult, and I know that you guys are working around the clock, and our community thanks you for your dedication and service. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Just. Our next speaker will be Lisa Karam. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good evening. My name is Lisa Karim. I am a parent of two elementary school children who will be starting <clears throat> kindergarten and second grade this fall. We have chosen option two virtual learning as we feel it is unsafe to return to school at this time. When discussing, when discussing the different options, both of my children on their own said that they want to be safe and do school from home because they don't want to get the virus or pass the germs to others. I want to thank the board for giving me an opportunity to voice my concerns as a parent and more specifically as a Muslim American who has resided in Virginia Beach for the past 11 years. I want to thank you for your commitment to our children's education and for diligently guiding us through these unprecedented times. Virginia Beach and Hampton Roads at large is home to a vast Muslim population whose children attend public schools. As Muslims, a critical part of our religion is to attend the weekly congregational Friday prayers. It is equivalent to the Saturday Shabbat service at the synagogue or Sunday mass at church. The Friday prayer takes place in the afternoon and typically lasts within the hours of 12.45 to 2.15 p.m. As it is currently scheduled, the virtual learning days are to be held from Tuesday through Friday, <clears throat> with Monday being a staff day. As a member of the Muslim community, this schedule puts me at a disadvantage. Since we went into lockdown back in March, our local mosques have been accommodating virtual Friday prayer services. This has served as an outlet for me to remain connected with my community in these uncertain and stressful times. According to the current schedule, between 12.45 and 2.30 p.m., my children will have lunch, 
physical activity, and math instructional windows. As five and seven-year-olds, it goes without saying that they will require constant supervision and help from me, which would cause me to miss my Friday communal prayers. During a phone conversation with one of the respected board members, I was advised that I can maybe work around the schedule or perhaps work something out with my kids' teachers. But that would not be feasible for myself and my children because they would have to miss an hour and a half of their structured school time every Friday. And we would then be required to try to incorporate those missed hours into a later time. For Muslim parents who wish to physically attend the Friday prayers at the mosque, the time missed from structured virtual school hours will be almost an hour longer when adding in commuting time, which they would have to then figure out a way to fit into a later time. It would not be fair to me, my students, uh, my children, their teachers, nor the hundreds of Muslim families residing here. To be told, and I quote, life is unfair and we all have to learn to deal with it is not an acceptable answer. To dismiss and disregard an entire community would be unfair. I humbly request that the virtual learning days be changed to Monday through Thursday instead of Tuesday to Friday. Thank you for providing this platform to voice my concerns here this evening. Hope you will consider the Muslim community as you make your decisions later tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rashid Kuld. Okay. Our next speaker will be Avery McNeil. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Avery McNeil, and I'm here to speak about why I, th I think kids need to go back to school in person. Excuse me, huh? Can you speak, maybe get a little closer and speak just a little louder? Okay. Good evening. My name is Avery McNeil, and I'm here to speak about why I think kids need to go back to school in person. If we go online for the entire fall quarter of school, my positive learning experiences will die. Last spring when we were virtual, I did not learn anything new and found it hard to communicate with my teachers. In the classroom, my teacher would teach a subject to us and it was easy to understand. If I had a question, I could quickly raise my hand or I could turn my de to my desk neighbor for help. I am lucky to have a mom who stays at home and can work with me, but even she had a hard time explaining some new ideas, especially math because she only knows the old school way. Many of my friends have parents who work or have a large family and didn't get as much support. This summer, my family went screen-free. No iPads, no phones, no mindless TV watching. Movie nights were allowed, but only because we did them together. My brother and I spent so much time swimming, crafting, fishing, biking, learning to rollerblade, playing board games, and using our imaginations. I'm happier, kinder, and less stressed without all the technology. Now, starting, now staring at a computer screen makes my head hurt, and I find it hard to concentrate. The thought of doing school this way again makes me overwhelmed and sad. Normally, the start of school is one of my favorite times of the year. I get so excited to meet my teachers and find out who my classmates are. If, we focused, if, we forced, if we're forced to do all our schooling online this fall, it will not only be boring, but suck all my happiness away. Being with other kids and teachers is important to me because it's a different kind of learning. In school, my teachers encourage me to speak in front of others. I'm normally very shy, but I've improved my confidence with their help. That is not the kind of thing you can do virtually. Please don't take away our chance of attending school this fall. Please don't chain us to our Chromebooks for hours on end. Please do not take away my opportunity to meet new friends. Please don't be afraid of the virus. Be more afraid of having thousands of kids struggling to learn. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lear McNeil. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lear McNeil, and I go to Old Donation School. I'm here to say I'm excited to go back to school. The reasons I think we need to go back to the classroom are, in the classroom, we are on computer, or we aren't on a computer as much as virtual learning. Being on a computer makes me feel kind of sad that we can't learn with my or that I can't learn with my hands and be active like in the like 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 we can in the classroom too there there are there are more there is more participation in the classroom online online it's hard to 
it's hard to work in groups and there are and there are less chances to show kindness to people. Thank you. Thank you. Did good. Our next speaker is Haley McNeil. And welcome. Hello. Our family has and continues to consider the pandemic a serious matter. We were diligent in adhering completely to the lockdown. We wear face masks in public to protect the most vulnerable. And we stay informed about the changing health recommendations both locally and nationally. That being said, I address the board members tonight to express my adamant support of upholding the current plan put forth regarding the return of our students to the classroom. Two weeks ago, unlike other regions in our country, you did not force an education decision on the families you serve. Instead, you presented a thoughtful plan with options based on expert medical recommendation and empowered parents to make the choice that's best for their children and their home life situations. Thank you for providing us that choice. Many of us who chose option one are driven by hope. We watch as the health metrics are improving and find hope that our kids can regain some of what has been lost during this time, even if it's going to look a little different. We aren't advocating for a free-for-all. We're not ill-informed or desperate for childcare. We understand the measured risk and find it to be reasonable. We have faith that our district and our board members have diligently crafted actionable steps that can lead the way to safe and effective face-to-face -face instruction. And in the event that our hope proves to be misplaced, and the numbers spike, your current plan already provides for that outcome in returning students to an online platform. Virtual learning is tedious at the very best. If my kids, who have an engaged at-home parent, zero food insecurities, outrageously comfortable shelter, gigabyte Wi-Fi, and who are both designated educationally gifted, if they struggle with the shortfalls of online learning, I cannot begin to imagine how it's affecting those with greater hardships. Please don't allow the fear mongering of your Facebook comment section to persuade you to keep moving the goalposts. For those of us who have opted in, we are knowledgeable and accepting of the in-person challenges. For us, it feels like a loss of hope. Will two weeks become nine? Will nine become 18? Will we be left waiting until COVID is eradicated to re-engage our students? You have already provided an entirely online option for those who are fretting the difference between 10 and 5% positivity. I implore you to stand in your decision to move ahead with the approved plan. Allow families to coordinate their first semester in tandem with the choices that you've given them. And I appreciate what you're doing for our community. Thank you. Our next speaker scheduled is Katherine Duncan. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I come to you today as a concerned parent um, of a student that has disabilities. Um, I'd like to begin by addressing my concern that Virginia Beach City Public Schools has been able to find a safe way to open learning centers and daycare for low-income families, city employees, and teachers um, within the school buildings. I do like that this is in place. It's wonderful. However, how can these programs be safe enough for these specific families, but not safe enough for students with learning disabilities? Why was it safe over the summer to have the ESY program with in-person teaching for these specific children? but not for this upcoming school year. My daughter has already fallen behind because of the virtual learning. I'd like to say that virtual learning during the extended closure was flawless and easy, but we all know that that's not true. Um, it was rocky and filled with obstacles in the dark, not only for the students, but for us parents as well. Um, without a lot of guidance, it seemed like we were always looking for something to do, um, you know, to help our children. 
um, to learn. Um, my daughter, who is a rising kindergartner this year, was one of those students left in the dark during the closure with some parts of her IEP not followed. Um, she never received individual or group, uh, or group speech therapy. Um, I reached out to her speech language pathologist twice in regards to what I can do to keep up with what they were working on during school before the closure. Um, her response was referring me to a blog that, and I quote, often that she often looks back on to help me with my daughter's speech goals. Looking at a blog is not going to help me help my daughter. I need her to have that in-person, person-to-person learning. That is what she thrives on. And a lot of disabled um, students also deserve that, and they also need that as well. Um, <clears throat> her speech regressed over time, no matter how much that I worked with her, to the point that I had to seek outside therapy. Um, she thrives in a well-structured classroom along with other peers. Um, where she has the ability to learn with hands-on material and one-on-one -on -one time with her specialist and her teachers that are in her classroom. How am I to trust that she will not slip through the cracks and be forgotten again? Having one day a week this past, um, this past March through June um, with synchronous learning was difficult. Keeping her focused on a screen with her classmates often ended up being interrupted and the screen changing from the teacher to the person or peer that was making noise or talking. Parents should have a choice whether to send their child back into the classroom. Uh, with that being said, I hope that for the Virginia Beach City Public Schools and Dr. Spence um, Reconsider allowing students with learning disabilities to have in-person teaching if their, if their parent had chosen to um, at the start of this school year. And I thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paige Caparici. Welcome. Hi, thank you. As soon as you decided to make school start virtually this summer, I, along with five other elementary school families, hired a teacher to teach our children three hours a day from nine to 12 on Mondays, when it will once again be a teacher work day. Our children lost so much educationally from March to June last year, and my one child's teacher never taught one lesson. School started two weeks ago for a group of six. We are rotating houses as meeting sites, wearing masks, and let me tell you, the children were so excited for this day and to be at school. They miss school. Children miss school. They were up before their alarms the first day. Their thirst for knowledge and excitement was so joyous to see and exciting, and it's also sad. They miss school. We are very fortunate that we can afford to do this for our children. And my heart hurts for all of the kids who can't have this opportunity. You are letting the children of Virginia Beach down. They are falling farther and farther behind academically, and you keep moving the goalposts to allow them in school for face-to-face -face learning, which is proven to be far superior to what virtual will ever be. First, teachers and parents filled out a survey, and the majority picked to return to school and face-to-face -face learning. Instead of listening, you voted and made the start of school virtual with metrics that you, Dr. Spence, agreed with Mrs. Weems on that might be too high to even get them back into the school building this year. Now, when our COVID cases have dropped and we entered yellow, yellow, and school could potentially start for elementary six and nine, two weeks after the virtual first day of school on September 8th, you said poised to vote to prevent school from opening again and to keep children home. Shame on you for moving and continually moving the goalposts. Parents and teachers have spoken and the majority on both occasions have picked to go back to school with face-to-face -face learning because that is what children need and that is how they get a real education. You, the school board, should be focused on strategies to successfully get students back to school, and you should not spend all of this time fighting to keep them out of school. 
You are supposed to have the best interest of our children. Science, the CDC, public health experts, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, pediatricians, etc., have said they need to be back in school. Children need normalcy. They need their peer groups and they need to develop social skills and relationships and for emotional well being. I see it in our educational pod we created with the six kids and their teacher. Children want to need school. Where is the spark for learning when you are sitting day after day, isolated, alone in your house, looking at a computer screen? Where is it? Virtual school comes with a devastating cost to our children's education, safety, and health. Adults are out living their lives, and our children are locked up at home. You had your childhood. You had your 30 education. seconds. You had your childhood. You had your education. Stop changing your rules and your metrics. Let our children have their childhood. Let them have their education. Open schools. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, are we reverting to the Zoom speakers now? Since uh, that was our last in-person speaker, yes, we were going to our online speakers. The first person up is Sarah Clark. Ms. Clark, please unmute. Welcome. Good evening. I want to thank you all again for all of your hard work and making sure that you're doing what's best for the kids. I've been teaching for 16 years, and one thing I know about policies and programs is this. The burden of figuring out details of implementation falls squarely on teachers and school staff. Whether this is by design or just the nature of school policy, it usually works. School administrators can implement policies in ways that suit the individual school, and teachers find a way to implement the policy in a way that suits their specific students. But in this case, it doesn't work. There aren't enough answers and there's too little time. And with too little information and not enough time, teachers cannot plan effectively. Both academics and safety of our students may suffer. I've been asked to read some que anonymous questions from staff and parents. I have not heard if my request for teaching virtually was accepted. Therefore, I don't know my teaching assignment. While I don't have my exact schedule, uh, I don't usually have my exact schedule. I do know my assignment in June. How can I use this time to prepare if I don't know what I'm going to be teaching? Who will enforce masks in the secondary school halls during class changes if teachers are cleaning desks? Will I be cleaning before and after lunch is served in the classroom? What do we do when our colleagues don't wear masks? What about our supervisors? Are we really supposed to police each other? Gator masks are ineffective. Will the mask policy be updated to reflect that? Vague answers about whether there are enough substitutes means the burden of a sub shortage would fall on teachers and support staff. Is it acceptable to ask teachers and staff who are already burdened with learning new ways of teaching and having break times encumbered by duties such as monitoring lunch? What is the availability for of substitutes for bus drivers that must quarantine or are out due to self screening? What is the availability of substitutes for nurses that must quarantine or are out due to self screening? Will refusal to wear masks properly be recorded in a student's permanent record as defiance? How do teachers manage the social emotional impact of forcing kids to follow developmentally inappropriate safety protocols? Is there professional development for this? Is there support for teachers making a high number of student absences? Why has there been so much inconsistency with communication from buildings, from school buildings? Some families and staff are getting information that many are not. This is especially pro problematic for parents of students in transitional years. If a teacher has both face-to-face -face and virtual students, do they have to make two sets of subplans for both groups of students? How is attendance being recorded? Are teachers responsible for making sure students aren't doing things they aren't supposed to do on their Chromebooks during the school day? Why am I being told that option two students are being merged with op option one students? When, staff, when will staff get information about the Safe Learning Center? Will this be available by the time we must be back at work on Thursday? 
Will teachers be required to prepare both synchronous and asynchronous options for students that cannot make synchronous teaching? Will teachers be required to clean rest, class restrooms after each use? If buses are delayed, how much instructional time will be affected? Why are some schools scheduling virtual meet and greets and drive throughs to pick up supplies when other schools have not communicated anything? Why, what is the status of HVAC maintenance? Why were school hours changed without notice? This interferes with childcare and other family schedules. What is the limit of the number of students in each person's, each teacher's class? In in-person classes, what about virtual classes? Will there be instructional time dedicated to teaching technology skills? That is time. Okay. okay. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jacob Ellis. Please unmute. Welcome. Before I begin, I want to thank you all so much for what you've been doing. Uh, I know how difficult it is, and I just want to thank you all again. Uh, hi, my name is Jacob Ellis. I'm a rising senior at Princess Anne. I'm a student in the International Baccalaureate Program, and I've come before you today to voice concerns that many of my fellow students and their families have regarding the proposed 4 by 4 schedule and how disastrous it will be for IB students. As you've heard earlier tonight, IB is an international organization with thousands of students globally, with complex multi-day exams for two year long courses in May, with sections of the exam beginning in the fall and ending in January. Across the world, students in nearly every country are on the same schedule and working on these strenuous standardized examinations that require extensive preparation and expensive prep. On the proposed four by four schedule, students would finish four of their diploma courses in January and would have four months until their exam with no precautions in place to prevent potential backsliding in these courses. Additionally, with internal assessments, which are the sections of the exam that are started in the fall and end in the winter, these would have to be condensed from multi-month processes into week or too long projects in addition to our already rigorous course load, countless extracurriculars, and test prep. For the spring semester, the 4x4 schedule makes the completion of these exams and internal assessments next to impossible. If students would not have finished all of their coursework before the exam, or would have to compress course material into less than a, by less than a month and a half at a minimum to begin preparing for these exams, all while working on their IAs and other extracurriculars. Because of the time between the end of the first semester and exams, students would be practically required to register for costly test preparation programs and materials which can cost thousands of dollars. Many students would be unable to pay for these informally mandated additional coursework and calling forth concerns of wealthy students potentially scoring higher on exams due to increased access to these materials. While less fortunate students would be punished by the consequences of their socioeconomic status that they have no control over. These students have been working towards their exam and diploma for upwards of seven years. Students need these diplomas to get college admissions, internships, scholarships, and other opportunities that would potentially lost because of this decision. I ask that when y'all consider the four by four plan to devise and implement an alternative plan that takes into account the unique situation of the students at Princess Anne and Green Run, but no fault of their own, stand to significantly lose if this plan is implemented. While the four by four schedule might work well for some in these communities, the four by four schedule will be disastrous and even risk the international claim and accreditation of these schools. Virginia Beach claims to be ahead of the curve, but it, it is one of the few decisions in the state to change to, into the 4x4 schedule. This will cause it to lose to one of its most cherished and distinguished programs, foregoing the ahead part in ahead of the curve. Please give the IB programs the autonomy and opportunity to create their own hybrid schedules that do not unnecessarily stress and harm students, allow students to take their IAs and IB exams as normal as possible, without cramming course materials into a shorter period of time or purchasing expensive supplementary materials. I hope that you could take the concerns of over 400 families at Princess Anne alone as well our futures are at stake here and we are deeply troubled by this proposal. A four by four schedule will not work, whereas an A and B day schedule will work and can work in the online and in-person classes. Thank you so much. And we hope that you listen to our concerns. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Malley. Please unmute. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? And welcome. Good evening, Superintendent Spence, Chairwoman <laughs> Rye, and members of the Virginia Beach School Board. My name is Kathy Malley, and I am a 20-year educator at the Virginia Beach at Virginia Beach, 
currently teaching pre-K at Arrowhead Elementary. I am also a member of the Virginia Beach Education Association's Board of Directors. Recently, a young student from my elementary school passed away. He was a rising second grader and his death was not COVID related. There was a wonderful outpouring of support from our school community. It is so sad when a child dies. His death affected me even more deeply because I am afraid of what is to come for our students, families and staff as a direct result of schools opening for face-to-face -face instruction in the yellow zone, people will die. If a person with COVID survives, they may have lasting health effects. Human life should be the priority for a safe reopening. Sadly, it is not. I am a pre-K teacher. I want nothing more than to be back in the classroom helping my students learn and grow together. This year, that is not possible. Until the cases of COVID infections are under 5%, classrooms are a dangerous place. As we know, this is an invisible airborne virus spreading in the atmosphere through many schools aging HVAC systems. If COVID is invisible, the risks are not. BBCPS is going in with eyes wide open in pursuit of reopening in the yellow zone. It is almost as if a hurricane is headed our way and we are refusing to evacuate. Staff, students, and their family members will die in the swath of this deadly virus. Some say 99% will survive the illness. That leaves 1%. 1% is too many. One life lost is too many. BBCPS school board members and Superintendent Spence do the right thing. Eliminate the yellow zone and its deadly metrics. It is not safe for families in Virginia Beach. Other school systems around the country have opened and serve as cautionary tales as to exactly how COVID will spread in the community. The wisest choice is to offer the option of virtual learning for the first nine weeks. As a member of VBEA, we do not want to be the organization that said, we told you this would happen. We want to be proactive, intelligent, and prepared to return to face-to-face -face instruction when it is prudent to do so. First nine online, green or red, safe instead. Thank you. Our next speaker is Peter Aloya. Please unmute. Welcome. Thank you, good evening. This is Peter Ayala. Uh, good evening, Dr. Spence, uh, Dr. Spence, school board members. Uh, I've spoken to you before. I'm a tech ed teacher at PAMS and a VBEA member. Uh, I want to thank you guys for all the work that you're doing, um, all the work that you're continuing to do. I know this is not an easy situation for any of you, and I do appreciate it. I appreciate everyone who is not only attending this meeting, but those that have spoken on behalf of our students and staff uh, this evening. Uh, from the passionate speakers, regardless of their stance, the overwhelming outpouring of concern and well thoughts or well thought out ideals are proof that this community really cares. I wish that feeling could be felt by all communities of our world. It's, it's really a beautiful thing. Um, but with that being said, even though everybody has great points and great ideas, we can't agree with everyone. And that's the issue. Uh, we all want the same thing, but we can't have it the same way. In order for some of us to be happy, others won't be. It's a hard fact, but it is what it is. However, keeping the yellow zone doesn't work for anyone. We've seen what rushing back can do, as we've seen school divisions scramble to pick up the pieces of causing the spread. By coming back for a few days and quickly having to close before, you know, because one metric drops down to red, causes more of a disruption than if, if we would have just waited for a green zone. And I mean, we even tried. We tried to adjust the yellow uh, to meet in the middle, but that got shot down. So we're left with only one option to ask that yellow zone uh, be cut. And the only other thing I want to talk about were the numbers coming from the surveys. Being a VBEA member um, and a rep at my school, I've gotten countless questions about what options people should choose. And I'm mm -hmm. just not, I'm not even talking about just teachers, I'm talking about parents as well. Um, and I appreciate the fact that they've looked to me for that counsel, but I genuinely didn't know how to answer a lot of the questions because the surveys were so confusing. Um, we even talked about it, um, you know, with people in our school in real time, like we don't understand how to answer these questions. 
And the same answer I had to give people was the same answer I was getting uh, from those people, which is do the best you can. And we can do better than that. So if we want to go ahead and really see what these numbers would be, what options most okay. teachers would have picked and parents, we need to go ahead and put the survey back out again um, and, and really see what it is now that we've clarified some of these issues. Um, so again, yellow zone's not gonna work, green or red, safe instead. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amber Sloan. Please unmute. What? Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, my name is Amber Sloan. I'm the Virginia Beach Council of PTA's Vice President of Programs. During this very difficult, different time, we have realized that our local PTA units needed a plan change to meet the needs of this time. And we created a way for them to obtain support. This is going to be a different year for all of us. Even if we are not in buildings as much as we have been in the past, we can still support our local PTA units and thus support the children and our families in our amazing school system. There was a national PTA COVID grant opportunity. We did apply for funding to assist with so many units, councils, regions, and districts also applied. We did not receive the additional funding for our plan. We are committed to our school district and decided whether or not we received the funding, we would find a way to support the plan and make it a reality. We had already laid out the infrastructure and planning in a way that didn't require funding. It just required support. And this type of guidance did not cost anything, but is so powerful. We sent out a thousand surveys to various members of our school system community which gave them the opportunity to choose between the platforms of distance learning, internet access, social and emotional support, and food insecurity. It did not ask which way they wanted to learn, but what was the most important platform to be addressed? By a slight margin in these results, distance learning support was identified as the greatest area of need with social and emotional learning being a very close second place. To begin to support for the need in our city, we are in the process of creating an empower and engagement support portal for parents and students that will be housed on the VBPTA website with a link shared for easy access for all families to the school website's PTA tab. This portal will have sections that house asynchronous videos and websites for parents and students. The portal will reference topics such as wearing a mask, social distancing, proper posture techniques to support distance learning, and asynchronous videos from school partners and various local businesses that engage students and get them moving and thinking, whether they are home or in the building. The power of learning and benefits of PTA can truly come to them. The portal will also include, but it's not limited to, asynchronous offerings from our community partners, Virginia Mocha, Virginia Aquarium, the Virginia Beach Fieldhouse, Mad Science, Hampton Roads, all people that want to see our children learn. Parents can also access their pieces of interest, such as school counseling pieces from school system staff, information from MindShift, support for gifted students, and support for students with special needs. We will continue to ensure that this portal will be updated in a manner that is in alignment to support our families through this ever-changing time. We will get through this time together. We are PTA. We don't need a building to support our local units, and we are stronger together. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kelly Walker. Please unmute. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chairman Melnick, Chair school board members, and Dr. Spence. My name is Kelly Walker, and I serve as the president of the Virginia Beach Education Association. I would first like to thank the school board for honoring our request to have the VBCPS Fall 2021 plan, 2020 plan placed on the formal agenda. As our community continues to adapt to the pressures of the pandemic and updated information on the virus presents itself, it is important the public has the opportunity to speak. Tonight, I would like to share with the board and administration the recent statement from the local education associations on the reopening of schools in the Eastern region. We are deeply concerned that further budget cuts will hamstring our ability to effectively implement the reopening plans in the school divisions located in the, within the Eastern region. Therefore, we asked our representatives in the General Assembly and the governor during their special session 
to provide the funding we need to support the unique needs associated with the reopening of schools during the pandemic. We asked them to restore the 500 million to K through 12 schools that was placed on hold and to provide another 600 million in emergency flexible funding so we may address the impact of the coronavirus in our schools. We are hopeful that we will receive the funding we need to reopen our schools safely, but it does not look promising. We are also concerned that the lack of a state plan to safely reopen schools continues to create uncertainty and divisiveness. Superintendents throughout the Commonwealth, including Dr. Spence, have been asked to make monumental decisions based on conflicting guidance documents and policy recommendations for safe, school, safe schooling during the COVID-19 pandemic. Tensions are high as the stakes for key decisions have life and death implications and the emo emotional roller coaster ride we are all on is quite frankly exhausting. The bottom line is that this process and the reopening plan is a heavy lift for all the employees. Our school division has never faced such obstacles and the pandemic has brought to light the many deficiencies in our systems. We did not have adequate funding to lower class size, pay our teachers and principals what they are worth and tackle our woefully underfunded capital improvement plan before the pandemic. And now with greater uncertainty in our economy, we are asked to do even more with less. This is why we feel as though the reopening plan does not provide a reasonable sense of security for employees to return to face-to-face -face instruction. We ask the school board administration to provide additional sick leave for employees so they do not feel compelled to come to work sick. The federal plan covers 10 days of sick leave. It's not enough. The lack of an adequate sick leave bank for school employees who contract COVID-19 adds a huge additional layer of anxiety for employees. In conclusion, I am so happy to see the COVID numbers declining in the Eastern region and hope beyond hope that the numbers quickly continue to decrease significantly. However, until the pandemic is over, I ask that the administration and the school board consider our ask as reasonable. From day one of the pandemic, we have asked to be given a reasonable sense of security by providing a sick leave bank or policy that makes sense during a pandemic and to make sure we have the resources we need to open safely. I urge the board to consider to slow down the reopening of school to face-to-face -face learning environment so we can fully focus on getting virtual learning right, implement best practices learned from lower PCR districts and have the time we need to improve support under these complex conditions. Thank you for listening to me. Have a good night. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gina Lane. Please unmute. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Gina Lane and I'm a teacher as well as a parent to two elementary age children in Virginia Beach. I'm concerned that our current fall 2020 plan is an overly aggressive approach to a safe return to in-person instruction. I am concerned that returning under the conditions outlined in the plan that we are returning too soon. The plan creates the potential for large scale outbreaks that places myself, my family and our community at a high degree of hazardous risk. Colleges are going remote after only a short time for in-person learning and schools across the country are seeing numerous COVID cases only days after returning to school. One month ago on July 25th, there were 321 positive cases in Virginia Beach to date for the ages zero through 19 age group. Now, one month later, there is now a total of 639 positive cases to date for the same age group. So in one month, we have had 318 children test positive. We are seeing the number of cases in children grow. What will the increase be when we return to school for in-person learning? Furthermore, I feel like the planning and logistics are being rushed. Let's slow down and do this right for the sake of our kids. There is too much uncertainty surrounding this pandemic to not err on the side of caution. If we were to go nine online, we would have time to get all the planning done right. We could fully focus on getting in virtual learning correct and it would provide consistency for our students. I would like to now read a letter from an anonymous secondary counselor. For those of you who may not be familiar, master scheduling is a complicated process by administrators, school counselors, and data techs to match students to the classes they need and assign a teacher for each class. Especially in middle and high school, this is at least a three month process. Now that we are doing four by four for the first time, that would add another month or two. So let's say it's a five month process. 
Now add the additional complication of sorting all students by option one and option two, and it's easily a six month process that you told us to complete in eight days. It could not be done with fidelity. We are rushing this process too much. Compare it to driving. If the speed limit is 55, maybe you have driven 70. But if we put you in a race car that goes from zero to 150, you are likely going to hurt yourself and others. Our students and teachers are going to suffer for this. You are also absolutely destroying your administrators and counselors energy and mental health, the very people you need to lead this very difficult school year. Please give building leaders the time needed to do this right. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kat Evans. Welcome. Hi. Hi, good evening, uh, Chairwoman, the board, and Dr. Spence. Um, I am a third grade teacher as well as a mother of a Virginia Beach student in the high schools, and she's going to be a 10th grader this year. And so I've expressed my concern before, and so I, what I wanted to address is that, first of all, my, I really would, I want face-to-face -face learning with my students when it's safe. My daughter wants to school, wants to go to school face-to-face, -face, but when it's safe, and I'm concerned about exposure, my daughter's exposure, my students exposures, my colleagues, um, and then the long term risks associated with ex exposure to COVID-19. Opening too soon may put our students at risk. There was a study in June and Nature Science magazine that found that students are not in, that children are not immune. In Iowa, Louisiana, Florida, Georgia, and Tennessee. The American Academy of Pediatrics reported that children are often asymptomatic, but can still have it and pass it on. We're putting our staff, families, our students' families at risk by opening too early. Children may have the virus and easily pass the health screening. Even if they're asymptomatic, parents, and we all have seen this, parents often give their children Tylenol before they come to school when they're sick to hide their illness because they can't miss work. Think about how many can be infected by just one of those students going to school that way. And we know this is a problem. We know this is going to happen because it already does happen with minor illnesses. How is this not going to happen with COVID? And there's no way to screen that. They may not have a fever because they took Tylenol and then they have it later. And even if they don't are asymptomatic, we can get it. We have a lot of people that can get very sick very easily. And that's very easily controlled by our our technology that we are that we pride ourselves in. And so if we're taking all of this pride in our technology, why can't we use that and keep our family safe until we're at a better metric? Across the country, schools are closing as after they have been opened due to COVID cases. Many have closed even before they opened because students had it or there was cases where teachers had their in-service week and then they got exposed to it and they had to close down the school because teachers had COVID. Uh, Virginia reported 1,005 new cases and then 23 new deaths just today in our state. Our numbers may have gone down slightly, but Labor Day weekend is right before school starts. And we all know there will be a spike in cases after that. At VCU, 58 students and 12 staff members tested positive. 10 students were reported positive at JMU before classes even started. Just next, near next door, the city of Hampton, they reported four COVID deaths today. And here in Virginia Beach, two teenagers were recently put on life support from contracting COVID-19. The yellow metrics, five to 10% is just not safe. Green and red is safe instead. I'm still pushing for the nine weeks online and let's go back when it's green and when it's safe. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kathleen Slindy. Please unmute. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Uh, thank you for welcoming me. Good evening, Chairwoman Rye and Vice Chairwoman Melnick, Dr. Spence, and the members of the board. My name is Kathleen Slindy. I have taught for 20 years and currently teach second grade. I am also on the Virginia Education Association and the Virginia Beach Education, Education Association Board of Directors. I teach and I serve on these boards because I believe in public education and I value the lives of my students and their families, those of my colleagues and coworkers and my own. As a teacher preparing for the opening weeks of school, I've been working through the essential training provided by our talented, hardworking instructional leaders and staff. There are a lot of great ideas and practices in them. 
Remember, these are the mandatory hours we work on through the summer, so we are ready to engage in planning for instruction. It is a foundational part of that training to use the data that, student, that teachers get from formative assessments to change and direct our instruction to meet the students' instructional needs. This practice of adapting and personalizing our instruction to our students' needs based on evidence, the data we observe, is vital as we teach our students. This said, I respect and appreciate all that has been done as part of the preparation of this 2020 fall plan. Many individuals have spent hours and hours on it, and I know that you believe this is the best plan for our district. But you also know that as a district, we use data to drive our work. So you must recognize that a plan dealing with a virus, that is by definition a moving and mutating target. You may also have to adjust your plan. When reviewing the data related to COVID-19 in our country, our region and our city, you must be willing to change your plan to reflect what is necessary and beneficial for our students and your employees to work together in the safest possible way. Are our buildings ready? Are they really the safest place for learning to take place when the metrics are yellow, yellow? Do we have resources, medical and um, personal protective equipment in our schools to address the safety and st of staff and students? Are they ready to go? Do we have the tools that we need for remote learning? Do all of our teachers know what or how they will be teaching? We begin our work week in two days. Will there be enough teachers, enough substitutes, enough custodians and cafeteria staff? Will they remain healthy so that we have people to meet our teaching safety and health needs? What happens if they don't? What will be the next steps if part of this plan fails? I'm sorry, I know I have a lot of questions, but I'm the mom of two boys and I have learned to plan for the unexpected, just in case. I don't think I'm coming up with questions you haven't heard. All of the VBCPS family, we are all asking them. And though I think I know what you would do, that you would do this, but since it's not stated in the plan, my ask is this, that you consider the metrics you set out in the plan to be guidelines that can be shifted or adjusted to fit the situation as this virus continues to provide data about how it is going to spread and affect our community. And if the data in the real world shows that anything more than a 5% positivity rate creates an unsafe environment for opening schools face-to-face, -face, which I believe it will, then the VBCPS should continue in the remote learning mode mode until that 5% or lower goal is reached. I urge you to make the first nine online. Doing this, slowing it down a bit, will give us time to be ready, really ready, to do that work in buildings only when it is safe. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mark Gerhart. Please unmute. Hello, my name is Mark Garhart. Uh, I am the father to three elementary school aged children in the Virginia Beach School District. Uh, my wife, mother and mother-in-law are all career educators. That being said, to use an analogy, teachers, administrators, staff and auxiliary school personnel are to students what doctors, nurses and healthcare professionals are to patients. They are essential to the education, well-being and development of current and upcoming generations of students. They are the very definition of essential workers. This work, this essential work, must be done face-to-face -to, -face to be effective. Virtual, impersonal, screen-based education is ultimately an ineffective half measure. Just as a virtual doctor visit would be a poor substitute if one needs hands-on medical care, the warmth, compassion, dedication, devotion, expertise, and inclusiveness provided by professional educators in person has no virtual equivalent. By most estimates, we are now within 30 days of meeting the metrics defined by the school board and adopted by the district to begin a full, a full and safe return, or at least a full for some parties, face-to-face, in-person classroom instruction. These metrics the same metrics identified, voted on, and affirmed as being the standard for safe return of in-person learning. That being said, why now are certain board members and the VBEA now proposing that an even higher bar be set for no apparent reason? What has changed? Creating a catchy slogan like the first nine online or the various others I've heard tonight doesn't absolve board members, the VBEA, or VB schools from explaining exactly what has changed since they deliberated weeks ago. If a district can meet its adopted mandates, mandates that have been known for weeks and months, 
Why are school board members and VBEA pushing for a change to the metrics, which again were discussed, debated, and adopted by the board weeks ago? It is certainly not due to a failure to consider the safety of the students, te teachers, and teachers and staff. Public meetings, a school board workshop, and countless hours were devoted to determining the metric for a safe return to in-person instruction. That bar for return, albeit a much higher by the bar than many thought was necessary, was proposed, amended, debated, and ultimately approved of by this very board. That same metric was also incorporated by the school district into their 2020 plan without any public objection that it was somehow an unattainable goal. Now certain board members and the members of the VBEA want the goalposts to be moved. Is the safe standard as it once was defined now invalid because we as a society are making progress? Let that sink in folks. Folks, the numbers are now trending negatively which should be a huge positive for our community, our economy, and should herald the return of in-person education. Listening to the VBA reps tonight, it's very clear that all you have to provide is catchy slogans and fear-mongering to prohibit in-person education under the very metrics and measures that were to meet the standards set out. Myself and many in the community have no faith that after our children and our community are held captive for the first nine weeks of this school year that the board, the VBA and others with unknown intentions would just adopt a new slogan to keep pushing the goalposts. After nine Thank weeks, you. one could imagine that the slogan will likely change to the first half, just don't prepare staff. Or how about this whole year, let's just shelter in fear. Catchy slogans for sure, but just as Hollywood free of actual substance. VB Schools has a chance here to be the example However, we have to lead by example and proceed with the plan, the plan that you all put in place. Thank you. Uh, Anita Ridge is not online. We will move to speaker number 12, Diana Howard. Please unmute. Welcome. Welcome. Ms. Howard, please unmute. All right then. Is that it for speakers, Madam Clark? That All for the agenda item speakers. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to uh, agenda item seven, approval of minutes, August 11th, 2020, regular school board meeting. Any modifications to the minutes? Uh, just one slight correction I noticed. I don't have it in front of me, but I noticed on the first page it has where it's listed who is present. It has me listed twice. You might want to just take that off. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay, a motion to approve. Motion Mr. Approved. Edwards. Amended. Uh, Mrs. Melnix, a second. Uh, so now uh, we'll call for a, a vote. Madam, uh, please raise your hand, school board members. We'll raise your hands to register an affirmative vote or will be called upon by the school board clerk after the voting is closed to indicate a no vote or reason for an abstention. And that's the process we'll follow this evening. We have all nine board members present voting affirmative as well as Ms. Owens and Ms. Weems raising their hand in the affirmative. It has passed unanimously. Thank you. Okay, adoption of the agenda. Any modifications to the agenda? Ms. All right. Uh, a motion to approve. So, so moved. moved. <laughs> I think I heard Mrs. Riggs and a second, Mrs. Holtz. Okay. Uh, uh, please. I'll, I'll, I. Entertain, I chair, I call for the vote, excuse me. Uh, please ra raise your hand in the affirmative. We 
We have all nine uh, school board members present voting in the affirmative, as well as Miss Weems and Miss Owens affirmative online. It passed unanimously. Thank you, colleagues. Number eight, consent agenda. I will now announce the items presented as part of the consent agenda. A, John B. Dye Elementary, Great Neck Middle, HRSD easement. B, gifted five-year plan 2025. C, policy review committee recommendations. One, policy 333, requisitions and purchase orders. Two, policy 338, competitive negotiations, awards, small professional service contracts. Three, policy 342, financial record keeping of individual school funds. Four, policy 759, relations with governmental agencies, Virginia Employment Commission. Five, policy 626, evaluation of new and existing programs. Six, policy 713, appeals of board decisions. 7. Policy 751, use of school board equipment. And finally, 8. Policy 758, relations with government, governmental agencies. And then that brings us to D, the school calendar for 2021 revision, E, religious exemptions. With that, are there any modifications to this consent agenda? All right, hearing none, uh, I will now call for a vote, or uh, excuse me, a motion to approve. <laughs> motion to approve. Mrs. Thank you, Mrs. Anderson, in a second. Mrs. Felton. So now, uh, any discussion? Okay, we just, okay, so uh, please uh, show a uh, vote, with the raised hand vote. <laughs> All nine board members present raise their hand in the affirmative, as well as Ms. Owens and Ms. Weems. It has passed unanimously. Thank you all. Okay, the action part of the agenda, personnel report, administrative appointments. Motion to approve. Mrs. Riggs, a second. Mrs. Hughes, discussion. Okay, raised hand vote, please. All present board members have voted in the affirmative, as well as Ms. Owens and Ms. Weems via Zoom. It has passed unanimously. Thank you. Are there any for you to report tonight, Dr. Spence? No, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Information program evaluation schedule 2021, and our presenter is Dr. Heidi Janicki. Yes. Um, good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, members of the school board, and Dr. Spence. I'm Dr. Heidi Janecki, Director of Research and Evaluation. This evening, I will share the proposed schedule of program evaluations that will be conducted during 2020-2021 based on school board policy 6-26. Before presenting the evaluation schedule for the upcoming year, I'll provide an overview of the evaluation reports that will be provided in upcoming months and adjustments made to last year's schedule due to the school closure. The reports that will be provided to the school board this fall based on the 2019-2020 program evaluation schedule are shown on the slide. First, an evaluation update for the digital learning one-to-one -one initiative will be provided based on a school board approved recommendation from 2017 following the last evaluation of the initiative. The year two implementation evaluation for the English as a second language program will be provided in October. And the final comprehensive evaluation for Schoology, the division's learning management system will be provided in November. There were four other projects that were scheduled for completion in 2019-2020, as shown on the slide. But due to the school closure, the availability of necessary data was impacted. The closure impacted the collection of survey data and implementation data as well as the availability of complete student academic and discipline data. 
While these evaluations were postponed to 2020-2021, the Office of Research and Evaluation will provide brief status updates on PBIS, SRT, and the EBA in December. As stipulated by School Board Policy 6-26, the proposed 2020-2021 program evaluation schedule, which will be shown on the next slide, was developed based on evaluation requirements for programs. Based on the policy, new programs or initiatives that operate with local resources are evaluated for a minimum of two years and then during the year of full implementation if a program takes more than two years to implement. In addition, programs that have been previously evaluated may remain on the schedule as a result of an evaluation plan for the program that was previously approved by the school board. Each year, the proposed program evaluation schedule is presented to the superintendent senior staff to obtain feedback regarding the recommendations. This year, we also shared the proposed schedule with the Planning and Performance Monitoring Committee for input. The proposed evaluation schedule for the upcoming 2020-2021 school year will require school board approval. <clears throat> Programs scheduled for review during 2020-2021 are shown on the slide. Based on a school board approved recommendation from 2019, an evaluation update of the school counseling program is included on the evaluation schedule as it was postponed from last year. The evaluation of the environmental studies program at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's Brock Environmental Center will begin during the program's first year of implementation. And the last year of the planned three-year evaluation of the ESL program will be completed. The final three evaluations listed are those that were postponed from last year, including the year one evaluation of PBIS focused on tier one implementation across all schools, the final planned evaluation of SRT focused on outcomes of the process, and the final comprehensive evaluation of the EBA after the program was fully implemented across all grade levels. And this concludes the presentation of the program evaluation schedule for the upcoming school year. I'm available for any questions at this time. Are there any? Okay. Well, fingers crossed that you'll be able to proceed with all of them. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to policy review committee recommendations. Welcome, Mrs. Linetti. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, <clears throat> School Board members, and Dr. Spence. I'm Cami Linetti, School Board Legal Counsel, and I'm here to present on behalf of the Policy Review Committee the recommendations coming from the August 13th Policy Review Committee meeting. First up is our equity policy. We're calling this educational. This will be a brand new policy. We presented on this last month. It looks a little bit different from what we were presenting last month. The Both PRC and Dr. Parrott and the Equity Council have worked extensively on this particular policy. Again, this is not a policy we've had before, so we're going to be recommending that you assign it to number 24. And we're suggesting the name Educational Equity. This is a significant policy, and I'm hoping that everybody took the time to read it. I'm not going to go through this in detail with you, but just explain where the concept came from. As we first presented in July, it looks a little bit differently. I went ahead and reorganized it to look more like one of our policies. After reviewing the information, it became obvious that a lot of this will have to be developed once the superintendent and his staff will work through the various assessments and they will be coming back to you with an equity plan. So we didn't feel like all the details were ready to be put into the policy. So we divide the policy out first is the first section A, which has to do with the purpose of the educational equity. The second is section B, which has generally accepted beliefs. These are um, issues that the school division is going to be committing to and various definitions to work with. The second section, uh, third section is Section C, Educational Equity Assessment Plan for Equity Priorities, Practices, and Reviews. It's directing the superintendent and the school board as to where the, the different areas you should be looking at. Particularly, it talks about the assessment that will need to be done in the development of an equity policy. Section D has to do with school board commitments. It talks about what the school board is going to do to support the superintendent in coming up with the plan. Also, what the superintendent and staff will be developing for you. Section E has to do with equity policy communication. This talk, section talks about how the superintendent and staff will work with the school board to get this information out into the community and work with students and staff. Section F has to do with curriculum instruction, so specific areas that we'd like to see that the st superintendent and staff work with the instructional cu curriculum out there and get information out into class instruction and addressing specific areas. And finally, section 
no, so section F. Section G will be policy enforcement again. Uh, authorized school board authorizing the superintendent to go forward and implement the policy based on regular and create regulations depending on what comes up eventually with the policy. Again, I've not read the entire policy because it is multiple pages at this point, and I don't know if any of the policy review members want to discuss this. Otherwise, we are going to be proposing that the school board adopt policy 2-4 as educational equity. Are there any questions at this time? Mrs. Manning. Um, I have a whole lot of questions because I really want to understand this document. It's, it's, it's very long and in-depth, and I, I have a lot of questions about definitions and budget impact. And so if you'll just bear with me as I go through these, um, if, if others would like to jump in and, you know, I'll be glad to yield my time if someone wants to jump in and take over. But I do have um, 15, 14 questions. So, I will know. Is Dr. Parrott? Dr. Parrott was going or to come down. Or Ms. Felton. I know Ms. Felton was presenting oh, right it. Me. Dr. Okay. Parrott may answer some of the questions as she's worked to develop the policy, too. Okay. Um, so my first one, and I'm just going to go through the document and reference what I'm, uh, the questions that I'm asking. So the first question is related to Section A. Um, what is the definition of cultural competence, and how is that determined? Good evening, and thank you, Ms. Manning. And so the, the definition of cultural competence and... And how do you determine, determine if someone is culturally competent? Well, at first, it's on a continuum. Cultural competence is on a continuum. And so how do we determine that? It's by one's actions, by one's words, and how they approach diversity um, in their work. And so it's on a continuum. Okay, what's the definition of it? Uh, I, I can't think of a definition right offhand, but cultural competence, well, let me start off with cultural. So culture is one's experiences, their ethnicity, their race, um, their, ex I already said experiences, their ethnicity, their race, um, and so the competence is their ability to adapt and to adjust to meet the needs of the difference, of the diversity if that helps. Okay, I'm going to have to digest that. Okay. Um, I'll move Me on too. to uh, I'll have to move on to my next one. Okay. Um, so, uh, what is educational equity? Is it providing the same resources to all students or is it providing equal outcomes? Educational equity is providing each individual child or student what they need to be successful. So it, it will look different. It could look the same, but it may be different. Okay, so how do we determine educational equity if it's different for each child? Based upon what that child needs to be successful. Okay. So, for example, some students need um, accommodations with, with reading. Some students don't. And so okay. we meet the students where they are okay. and provide them the resources that they need both human or whether it's a supply or a, a material. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, item B3, it references um, childbirth or related medical conditions. I, I was having a hard time understanding what related medical conditions might be. Those are, oh, okay. Yes, please. Mrs. Manning, that comes out from policy 5-7 and policy 4-4. Those are your non-discrimination non and non-harassment categories that are found in there. So childbirth, <laughs> pregnancy and childbirth, child-related conditions come out of the Federal Pregnancy Protection Acts and also some of the Title IX in there. So let's say you had um, a, a complication coming out of pregnancy, a, a C-section, you weren't able to come back to work or something like that, or you were a student on there, we'd have to take that into accommodation, oh. how to deal with you, you had some hypertension, something like that it related during your pregnancy, those we have to take into okay. account in there. So those comes out, that, those are just the, um, some of the categories that we use for the non-discrimination policy that okay. come from various acts. So I, I was just surprised that paternity wasn't in here. If so, if there's a related uh, medical condition related to childbirth, what about paternity if the father would need to care for 
the mother. Um, I think right that now that's be not a protected well. class. Unless it's not. it's not technically a protected class on there. It could fall under a fa Family Medical Leave Act. You might be able to title, but it's not a protected class for non-discrimination issues. Okay. Um, and then item B three also. It talks about strict equality of opportunity and resources between students may not result in educational equity. So to me, this seems to go back to um, more about equal outcome so than equal. So I think I could <clears throat> probably speak to that and, and perhaps tackle the, the conversation about what is educational equity and is that the same thing as equal outcomes and equal equal distribution of resources and i want to go back and talk about cultural competence for a second because you said it was a lot to digest and i want to make sure we give you a clear definition of cultural competence as well so um i'll, I'll just start with an example our title one schools as an example um, we allocate additional funds to title one schools through federal funding in order to what's talked about in the in the regulations there is level the playing field for students who come to school at a disadvantage because of poverty and so the intention there is that you are, for example, putting in additional reading specialists for students who may come to school already behind in reading. And so that students who don't have those challenges would not necessarily need access to a reading specialist because they're not coming to school with the, that far behind in reading. And so it's about allocating resources strategically to make sure that you're meeting the needs of students where they are in that moment and where they are in their learning process. So it's not about strict equal um, allocation of resources. And oh, so, yeah, I understand that. You know, it's like the class size part. reduction right. efforts that you see when you're using Title I, Title II funding to reduce class sizes. You're doing that because you understand there are students who have particular challenges and you may need to have smaller classes to address mm -hmm. those challenges. So that's what the equitable access, uh, allocation of resources is really is really talking about if those kind of specific examples help. And then, and then just specifically to cultural competence, um, it's the ability to interact with people and understand people across different cultures, right? And culture, I think you could define it a lot of different ways, but it's one's worldview. It's, um, um, again, as was talked about, it's race, but it's different practices within a community. And so there's a lot of ways you can define culture. And the idea of cultural competence is being able to be aware of that, being able to have perspective about that, being open to that, being able to interact effectively with people who, who come from different backgrounds than your own. And so I think that's what we would be thinking about when we talk about cultural competence. Yeah, I guess, you know, in a policy, I want to look, look at something that's measurable. And I don't, under, I don't understand how we're going to measure that. So I'll just move through my questions. Um, so... My next one is related to I, I just want to, could I ask, what do you mean by that? In a policy, you want to look for something that's measurable? Because I think well, we could go through like a lot of policies, a lot in our mission statement, well, and a lot of other says, places. It it's not specifically that, measurable. It says so that I you're going to be, um, it says that you're going to be responsible for enforcing the policy and creating um, regulations and practices. So I'm just trying to understand what that's going to look like. Right. So as a, for example, with cultural competence, there's, there's, significant professional learning that's available on cultural competence on how to create classroom environments that are more welcoming of other people's cultures of being aware and attuned to other people's cultures in your classroom of not making you know of making sure that people feel welcome in the learning environment and that their culture is respected understood and welcomed in that environment and so an example of being able to measure and be sure that we are attending to cultural competence amongst staff would be to provide those learning opportunities for staff so that that cultural competence exists amongst staff, that we would insist that that's part of what we expect from staff in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. So that would be an example of how we would make sure that that happens versus I'm not necessarily sure we could, I mean, there isn't like a test for cultural competence, right? So I'm not sure we could give you like quantitative data in terms of measurement, but I could say we're providing professional learning on cultural competence for all of our students. And in theory, then if you're doing that, you'll get responses on, on surveys with students that say things like, I feel welcome in this school, I feel welcome in my teacher's classrooms, and you would be able to then sort of begin to quantify it that way. Okay. Um, on five, uh, on, on, on B5, it says, racial inequity means the absence of institutional instructional it's a barriers. Typo. You, does yeah, that, a should that mean the presence of institutional it's a typo it's it a should typo, say racial, racial equity not racial inequity thank you okay. that's a typo sorry okay lots um, of people have read this so 
<laughs> okay. Um, and then let's see, item C2. So um, this is a budget impact for me. Um, it authorizes the superintendent to employ or re retain outside services. It does not set a dollar amount. It doesn't talk about it being through competitive bidding. Um, and, you know, I just, especially during this time right now of limited budget, uh, you know, limited budget, um, I, I have some concerns about just putting out a blanket amount there that, you know, authorizes the superintendent to do this, which I think should perhaps maybe be a board issue. So I'd like to throw that out there to um, those who created the policy to look at. Um, and then um, item D1. Um, so, you know, I was asking the question about um, if, is this about equitable resources or equitable outcomes? And in item D1, it specifically talks about um, support the superintendent in identifying processes and practices that cause or contribute to inequitable outcomes. So to me, this is going beyond providing um, equitable resources to everybody, but but promoting equitable outcomes, and we can't guarantee outcomes. There are much many different facets of issues that go into what an outcome is going to be. Um, is a parent involved? You know, the best predictor of student success is parental involvement. So if we as a school division have, you know, put every resource out there that we can to a student to help them, um, and their outcome is different. That doesn't mean that we have an inequity in our division. Well, so I have some major concerns when we talk about creating equitable outcomes. And so, Ms. Manning, what, what that portion of our policy gets at is that we need to examine what's working well for students and what's not working well for students so that we can then change our approaches and our practices for certain groups of students to ensure that they have equitable access that changes the outcomes they may be having, which may, which in, in turn may be negative outcomes. Because right now, we can predict, unfortunately, which students are going to be in uh, advanced placement classes, which students are being eligible for gifted services based upon historical outcomes from students. And so we want to get to a point where we can identify in our school division what's working well for students, what's not working well from them. And this really gets at that equity audit that is being that we will conduct here in Virginia Beach to get at that. What's not working well for some students and what can we do differently to meet their needs? Okay. Um, then item D6 talks about mandatory training for staff. And I have some concerns about this because our teachers and staff have a lot on their plate right now, so I'm concerned about adding yet more. Um, so that's my first concern about that. And then um, I would like to know who will be conducting this training and can I get a copy of it? And so, so when you say one more thing, that's where we want to get away from here in Virginia Beach. This is an integrated approach. And so our staff in the Department of Teaching and Learning, they are providing cultural responsive practices and training for teachers. So it's in addition, it's in integrated into our reading and math and science and history, professional learning. So it does not have to be an isolated professional learning, because you, like you shared, they have a lot going on, our teachers, with training. And so this is ongoing, and it's not going to be in isolation. We're going to work with our Department of Teaching and Learning and other departments and offices to ensure this is an integrated approach, building everyone's capacity so that it doesn't have to be isolated. And uh, we don't have a list to provide at this time. But as we develop our equity plan that includes our professional learning plan, that that will be available to the board. So we don't know what the training is going to be right now or who's going to provide it? Not in isolation, no. But culturally responsive practices, uh, which is out outlined in our strategic framework and also mentioned in this draft equity policy, is ongoing training that's being conducted in the Department of Teaching and Learning. Okay. And then it also mentions mandatory training for school board members. And at the end of the document, it says that the superintendent is authorized to um, enforce this policy. Um, you know, we as elected officials um, can't mandate t any, any type of training. Well, I would love to go through it because I really want to see what it's all about. Um, we can't mandate that to each other, and the superintendent has no authority to enforce it. So I think that that needs to be removed. 
And so, as I shared, to, to ensure educational equity for our students, mm -hmm. it starts with all of us, with the adults. To right, ensure. yeah, and I said I would love to do it, but we, we just, as elected officials, you know, it can't be mandated. There's no, there's no power in that. Okay, and, and, and so again, the, the goal is to build capacity of all adults that work with students. And, and our families. And so, again, it's an integrated approach. Um, I don't see that potential training, which hasn't been developed yet, being something that's in isolation, but something that we can incorporate in training that the school board goes through, whether it's a retreat or any other function that you all have. And again, that's something that, of course, we will need board approval and your, your support with. Yeah, Ms. Linetti, would you like to address the mandate for school elected officials? I think among yourselves, you can decide as a school board that this is something you want to commit to doing and, and do in that sense that it's something the school board will commit to do whether you're in a mandate or not, but you can sit, certainly decide that you as board are going to go through the same training. Okay, but it can't be mandated, correct, as an elected official? Not a legal requirement. Is you can put requirements on yourself, just as you would put requirements on spending and following procedures and meetings. You can set your own requirements for your board. <coughs> So I could tell someone that they have to go have a physical exam and as a requirement, Miss, Miss Hughes, I'm going to, the board is going to vote to require you to go have a physical exam. We, we could mandate training, we could mandate whatever. You can, the SPOR can put in a commitment to doing something. Now, how you're going to enforce it might be another issue. Right. Whether you're going to enforce it or whether there will be consequences for that may be the issue. But you could, as a board, commit in a policy, much like you do other areas that you commit to doing. You can, as a board, commit to doing that. Seems like you could you could remove the for all school board members from six and then put in an item seven that says provide the same training for all school board members. Just provide it. Yeah, that it. would be better. I, I like and you that. Could tackle the same up uh, same intention without the mandatory piece which I think is Miss Manning's concern just it just legally I, I just if we're if we're creating a policy I want it to you know match the law so you know the state and, and can, the state can mandate can create laws and mandate us to take training like FOIA training things like that but the local school board doesn't have that power Um, and then I'll try to get through these pretty quickly here. Um, there was one definition. I, I, I've never heard this term before, and so I'm trying to understand it. Item E1, um, it says the mission to end the predictive value of race. Can you tell me what that means? Yeah, it, it's, it's um, fairly straightforward. Um, if and this goes to it's actually kind of a, aligned to your earlier question about equitable outcomes or inequitable outcomes. There are there are any number of data points in the school division that are aligned to data points at the state level that are data, aligned to data points at the federal level that are predictive by race. So, for example, suspensions is predictive by race. You are far more likely to be suspended in Virginia Beach City Public Schools, far more likely to be suspended in Virginia, far more likely to be suspended across the country if you're black. You're far less likely, you're far more likely to have a graduation gap. You're far more likely to have a reading gap. You're far more likely to have any number of predictive pieces of data that are inequitable outcomes in school divisions across the country, Virginia Beach City Public Schools included, which I think is the aspirational value and intention of this policy, which is to say those things should stop. We should try to uncover those inequitable outcomes, put understand the processes and structures that may be leading to those, and see if we can't alter those outcomes so that we have more equitable outcomes so that by race, by um, poverty, by all of those other things that are protected classes, you can't predict how a student will, will fare academically. You can't predict the number of times they'll be suspended. You can't predict their graduation rate. You can't predict any number of other things, you know, their access to rigorous coursework, whatever those things are that we could look at and say, these are nationally, state, and locally predictable outcomes based on, on different variables. Well, what if those issues, what, if, what about those, those outcomes are because of something outside of the division's control, the student's living situation, parental involvement? Um, I mean, it just, it seems like, 
there's a lot here um, that we can't control that is, is a, societal, um, a societal impact and not necessarily one that's caused by our teachers or um, our resources. I guess so. I would argue in the long run relative to this policy specifically that it's our obligation to make sure that's true. You know, that just because a child has an unstable home environment doesn't mean necessarily that we can't change the outcome for that child. That's the whole point of education. And so from at least from an aspirational, but certainly also I think an operational perspective, we should be doing everything we can to make sure that's not true. That those things that we don't control for don't necessarily limit the child's future potential in terms of equitable outcomes. Right. So I, I understand the point that you're trying to make. But then the, the point that I would make is just because a child comes from a single family home, just because a child has an unstable home environment, just because a child's parents are alcoholics, whatever those things are, should not limit their potential in our school division. And we need to figure out just because a child's black shouldn't limit their potential in our school division. And we just need to figure out are there structures and processes and issues within the school division that are preventing that from happening in terms of their success and that's what this policy is all about so i i understand people want to say well let's we can't fix everything but we better make sure that what we're doing isn't the problem and so that's the i think that's the key so conversation, do you feel right? like do you feel like we're doing some things that are that i mean do you feel like we have racist teachers i mean do you feel like we have racist practices that are that are causing these things i mean i would like to identify that if you think that because we have this big equity policy then maybe we need to you know really address that head on well i think we need as a school division to be willing to be engaged in anti-racist work mm -hmm. right so it's one thing to to say i'm not racist right but then it's quite another to say well are we engaged in anti-racist work like are we evaluating yeah and the degree i think, to which I think our structures we are i mean i think you've done a great job with that well, I, and I, I think we I have do. more to do because um, quite frankly i'll give you an example right now our discipline data hasn't moved a lick in terms of predictability based on race and so I think there are more questions that we have to dive into. And I think this policy is suggesting a way forward to do that, to develop a plan, to be careful and attentive and thoughtful about what precisely we're doing as a school division and to be overturning those stones and understanding where are our challenges and our opportunities. So it's not what we what we have to avoid is finger wagging. This isn't about finger wagging, right? This is not like pointing at somebody saying you're a racist teacher. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, are the structures and the processes systemically embedded in the school division? And do we have an opportunity to uncover that and then work to overcome that? And that's what I think the policy is explicitly stating. Interject a moment. Would this be a good time to just elaborate a little bit more on, on what an audit might look you know what, what possible charge we would i know it's not all detailed out yet but the audit speaks to i think some of mrs manning's questions yes and it gets at what dr spence just shared it's like turning over every rock and i think the most important rock that we would turn over is getting the qualitative data from our students from from our community not just looking at the numbers because we have access to many of that data now but actually hearing from our students, from our teachers, from our community members, the diverse community members we have here in Virginia Beach, what's working well for us? Where are areas where we can improve so that we can have a plan that meets the needs of our diverse learning community? And so that equity um, audit, I envision it being many focus groups to include our school board, to include um, students which i think are the the missing link in many of our conversations around equity is getting the voices of our students and i i know personally this spring due to covid and the the racial unrest in our community and our nation we're hearing more from our students about what they need from us and what a great opportunity to put that as part of our plan so that we are working for our students and we're hearing directly from our students what they need to be successful the same goes for our teachers. When it c relates to cultural competence, our teachers realized, based upon what's going on in the world now, and even prior to COVID, they need more to meet the diverse needs of our students. They want to meet their needs. They want to know 
how to address experiences they have not had, how to talk to that parent that speaks a different language and not English, how to communicate and be a supporter in education with our community and with our families. And so this equity audit would give us an opportunity to not just look at the data, but to hear the voices of our community. If we're going to be great, we need to hear from everyone. And so we'll work with our various offices to ensure that we're getting the diverse voices of our community. We heard some of them tonight, but that's not everyone's voice that came in to speak. And so we want to ensure we hear the diverse voices of our, of our community and especially those vulnerable student groups that we're talking about, our students that experience poverty, our black and brown students, our ELL families. And so that audit <clears throat> is really turning over every rock so that we can develop a plan and put practices into place that meet the need of our diverse learning community. So that's what I envision so, that looking like. And if I could just say one last thing and then I'll be done. I, I was one of those minority students. Um, so I understand it very well. <laughs> um, but I, I think maybe what could help me understand it even more is you know, let me see the, the training and, and the, the curriculum or whatever it is that you want to implement. I would love to be part of that. I'll, I'll sign up tomorrow to come and do that if, if you've got that ready for us. I don't have that ready for you, but I do have some materials that we're currently using around culturally responsive practices. And so I'll be more than happy to share those, that information with you and how it's being used in our schools and how it's been shared with our teachers. And principals, I can definitely share that. That would be wonderful. Board, yes. And it, you know, when do you think you'll have the training? Because I, I kind of feel it's, it's odd to vote on a policy saying we're mandating training, but we don't know what the training's going to be. This specific training has not been planned yet. Again, we, our goal is to complete the equity audit to give us more guidance. But again, the cultural responsive practices, that training is integrated into our current training that we're offering for teachers. And well, it will be offered through the fall, but it's not part of this essential training. Oh, yeah. If you could just, about. yeah, whatever is being offered to the teachers right now, I'd love to, I'd love to do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll share. I'll share. Okay, great. You. Thank yeah. you. No problem. And, and I would just add, I think, you know, from a policy and governance standpoint, this policy is about providing the direction to provide the training. Mm -hmm. And then it's the administration's obligation to go out and make sure that that training gets provided in a way that's effective and is helping us meet our goals, right? I mean, so we have other policies that talk about other trainings for staff. They don't directly talk about what the training is. It says the school, the, the superintendent will ensure that that training happens. And then we go find the training and make it happen. So I think this is more about giving that direction to have that training and then working with the DEI office, making sure my job then to make sure that that training is occurring. And certainly we will provide an update and overview to the board on what that training looks like. And we do have some training that we use now, mm -hmm. courageous conversations around races and other training mm -hmm. that happens in our schools. And so we can certainly share some of what happens now, but in terms of what will happen for everybody, that's something I think we'll have to investigate as we um, sort of uncover what the need is. And that's what I was going to share with you, Mrs. Manning, our, our framework for courageous conversations about race, our culturally responsive practices, professional learning. I was going to share those overviews with you and with the board. I just have to go back to the uh, agenda. <laughs> so, Mrs. Lynetta, you're continuing with other policies, yes? We're going to go on to bylaws. And again, bylaws are the rules by which the school board governs themselves on there. We last, this is what we originally took up with the bylaws when we were um, looking, starting the policy review committee about four or five years ago. So, we haven't looked at a lot of them in a while. In the process of the Governor's Committee working on the norms and protocols, manual and potential training for new school board members, we went through and looked at some of the um, rules and how we go about things. And one of the things that came to our attention that we probably need to pay more uh, to take a closer look at was the school board standing rules. Now, this is not actually listed as a bylaw number. That You have two appendixes to your bylaws. One is the standing rules. One are the... Um, certain rules that you follow, uh, procedural rules that you follow. The standing rules is Appendix B. What the standing rules do is they set up basically how you're going to run a meeting and this is sort of how you get your agenda planning issues on here. While looking through this, we, can't, we realized some of the stuff was outdated because we've changed some of the procedures and times on there. So looking at Appendix B and Section A has to do with time, place, and order of business. We just correct that generally you start at 4 o'clock or it's otherwise set. 
Moving down to section, uh, the first section is informal meeting. Then we go to the formal meeting. And just to point in, uh, to bring to your attention, when we did our meeting on July 28th, you did not actually adopt your budget until 1030 at night, and you'd already been in for about five hours in their meeting. So Candace, look at them. Why did we do it that way? Well, because we set forward the rules and how we set our agenda in here. That was when they actually brought up in governance. So if you look at the formal meeting, we're suggesting lead the call to order and roll call at 6 p.m. Moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance would be five. Number six is student employee awards. In this particular section, um, you'll notice we're referencing to bylaw 139. This becomes important because you'll see later on in the standing rules, we had all the rules set out there that didn't make a lot of sense. So we're just going to put the reference now to bylaw 139, which I'll be going over a little bit. Then we put a section seven, the adoption of the agenda. It made most sense that we adopt your agenda right as soon as the beginning of the meeting as we could. Then we know that the superintendent's monthly report would come in. And then we put number nine as approval of the meeting minutes. Get that done close to the beginning of the meeting. Going on with hearings of citizens and delegate agenda items. This is where we started making some changes on that. Um, and this has come up a couple times in the last month or so. We noticed there were several different times which different types of speakers could sign up for. That became very confusing for us to do that. So one of the things we're going to take recommend taking out on there is the various times where you can set up. Also, this particular section, you had a rule that said you would hear agenda item speakers up until 7.30 at night. So once you started this thing, you would go to 7.30 at night. And that limitation was then you would stop then and you would go on with the rest of the meeting. Then you would pick up your agenda items, the rest of your agenda item speakers at the end of the regular meeting. The PRC talked about this along with governance and that didn't make a whole lot of sense. So they're, they're recommending that you pull out the limitation to 7.30 at night, that you will hear all agenda item speakers before you go on with the rest of the meeting. But to accommodate that, they're suggesting instead of four minutes that you do three minutes. That would cut down the time on that one, so you'd move it to three minutes, but you would also then hear all the agenda item speakers. Going on then, we would adjust the agenda to be consent agenda would be 11. Under consent, you normally have your commemorative resolutions. So the PRC recommendations come up almost every month. We went ahead and put them on there with the religious exemptions. 12 would be action, 13 is information, also noting policy review committee recommendations since we always seem to come up with those. 14 would be committee reports, a definition of what committee reports are. 16 would be hearing of citizen delegations on non-agenda items. Again, this would be matched the same restrictions that we had up top, which is three minutes. Going on 17 would be recess into workshop and closed section. 18 is vote on remaining action items and 19 would be adjournment. What you see after that with section B, explain the rules for what awards and recognitions you would put in there. It didn't make sense that it was here. And as I'm not quite sure how that originally came up, but we've now, you'll see, I've moved that over into a bylaw that we're going to come up on later on. Also, for some reason, we also had the procedure for the annual election for the chair in here, and it was also set in bylaw 137, but some of the rules don't appear in bylaw 137. We're gonna, I'm going to share, we're going to move that, so we're going to recommend taking that out, and then those would be the, the um, remaining changes that we would have for the standing rules. Are there any questions on the standing rules? Mrs. Anderson. Um, I, 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 we should have caught this when we were having our meeting, but um, go up to where it says... Um, uh, just above where it says consent agenda, where it's explaining, um, have signed up to speak with the clerk of the school board and shall be allowed three minutes each. And then it's, it's crossed through um, until 730. And then it says if time is available. Correct. So that should be removed. we probably should remove if time is available because we decided we would go ahead and listen to everyone. Remember? Correct. So we, we probably should scratch if time is available. And then right after that, it says citizens, I think it, it, it should, it, it's supposed to say must sign up, but it doesn't, it's messed up there. It says MU and Strike then out and correct, to yes. sign up. So can you fix that? Or yes, it'll be citizens must sign up by noon of the day of the meeting. As mentioned before, we had several different time periods. There'll be one time period for all speakers to sign up. That actually makes it easier right. for us to assemble so, the list. Because what we decided was we were not going to cut off everybody, anybody at 7.30. We were just going to listen to them until, until we've heard everyone. Are there any further questions on standing rules? Uh, Mrs. Hughes. And then Mrs. Manning. Why are we cutting the time back to three minutes instead of four? I think when looking at this, they realized because we noticed in large amounts of speakers on here, 
three minutes would allow more people to get into the time period, into the speakers, and they figured with three minutes in there, but by not limiting them to 7.30, you would be able to get more speakers in during the regular meeting, and they thought three minutes was an adequate time. That is the old time that used to be in there. And mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's uh, also the same time as uh, frame as what city council has. They have three minutes also. Well, and that brings me to my second question. Why are we shortening the time that they're allowed to sign up? City Council allows you to just walk on in and sign up as you walk in the door. It seems like it was 3 o'clock, but then it said, please sign up by noon. And then we've had times where it got cut off the day before. If we have something going on, and especially when we have at the last minute, things are added to the agenda, and that seems to be allowed here lately, then speakers should be allowed to sign up at the last minute. Otherwise, don't, don't add things at the last minute. It seems like dirty pull. So we thought... We would just keep it at everything is at the same time so that it would just be consistent. Well, you said consistent with city council. So, I mean, one, you're changing. No, not consistent with city council. Consistent for us. Everything is 12 o'clock. It used to be one was 12 o'clock, one was 3 o'clock. It was confusing. So we just thought, okay, let's just make everything consistent. 12 o'clock is the cutoff. And the reason for that is because our clerk has to, especially now that's going on, has and there's there's logistics involved in getting people their names and everything all that done so we just felt like okay we need we need to be consistent we need to have a cutoff time that's consistent and um, it would give our clerk time to to get things set up and ready for us then I think we should allow an exception if we add things onto the agenda at the last minute so that citizens can weigh in on them that's that's who we work for they should be allowed to weigh in I, I like it the way it is right now. It's at 12 o'clock, so, I, you know, you yeah. could send it back to the policy if, if that's what you're asking, but I don't know what the other policy committee members want to say. May I just ask for clarity for everyone here? What was the, the up till this point, we've had two time deadlines? There was actually clarify? three um, on there. You could do, um, I'm trying to think it was three. It was like three, uh, three o'clock for one time period. If you wanted to be non-agenda, would be another time period. And there was also in one of the bylaws also stated that if you missed a time period or came in late, you could be added to the end of the time period. But there was a separate time period. Um, I think it was up to three thirty for non-agenda item speakers. And we found with time, it gets very confusing to get the list of speakers out, get everybody organized to do that. And then, as we've seen, there's confusion depending on how we've written the notice for the speakers or special meetings. So we thought if we set one time period, we'll know the time period when it's set up, we'll be able to organize your speakers for you. And it does take a bit more work. I mean, I know it looks like it's easy, but it's not. There are a lot of people involved in it. So, you know, you can't run up right to the time period of the meeting and effectively get your speaker list done. Dan. Mr. Edwards, I, I I'm sorry, okay. please. Okay. Um, so I remember when we had this conversation a couple of years ago, when we changed it from three minutes to four minutes. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason, and we used city council as an example, city council, it's my understanding, has three minutes per agenda item. So we said, well, why don't we, we only allow, you know, one speaker on agenda items so why don't we increase it to four minutes and they can speak on any agenda item they want or multiple items at a time. So from my recollection, and um, Dan, I know that, you know, this was important to you, I think. So maybe you're, maybe you remember this better than me, but that's what I recall. And, you know, if you're using city council as an example, Ms. Anderson, they allow speakers to sign up up until on agenda items up until the moment of the meeting. The clerk is in the back taking names. Um, so, you know, just for, I know it's hard right now. It's very hard right now with the way we're set up, but when we're creating policy, we're not in bylaws, we're not creating it for right now. We're creating it for years to come, hopefully. Um, and so I feel very strongly that we should not reduce the time, the amount of time that we are allowing, um, the public to speak for us, our employer. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Edwards. The only thing I'd point out, and I'd appreciate Cammie confirming, we are, if we are holding a formal public hearing, that would remain an open uh, sign up 
right up to and through the meeting, a, a public hearing, which we only have a few of each year. You're talking about mandated specific hearings, that's, like a budget hearing, a, a, a right, change, right. a zone change we, hearing. We, we do some on the budget. We do some. We have to do them on, re, on redistricting when we do that. And, uh, and a strategic plan requires, you know, there are items that trip the public hearing, and, and those would remain open, sign up, even during the hearing itself. The, um, on, on the other, we have an agenda which fortunately we don't change very often, the last month notwithstanding, um, but we normally, in fact it's, it, it is unfair to throw an action item on um, after the agenda is out. We, you know, if we're if we are board members and we're, we're doing that, we're not being fair to our colleagues and we're being grossly unfair to the public. So I think, um, but because of that, the agenda is 99.9% .9 of the time out there on Thursday, and it's not unreasonable to have it digested and, and an opportunity for people to sign up by, by noon on the day of the meeting. So that, that's the logic that's gone into it. Obviously, we can rethink it, but uh, I think it's sound. Anybody else? Mrs. Manning. Yeah, Ms. Rye, I, I sent in, and maybe this is, I don't know if this is the bylaw that it would go into, but remember a few months ago I sent you an email asking us to consider um, sending, notifying parents of our agenda, what's on our agenda. Do you remember that? It was something that a district was do doing in Colorado. I do remember you ha You sent me an example from out of state, and yeah. I have to confess so, that I mean, I'd be happy to take a look at it. I just can't recollect Yeah, because it details. would probably fit in here um, into this. It was really cool. I mean, the um, they would, would send out an email with the minutes and the, uh, the minutes from the previous meeting and the agenda for the next meeting to the public, to parents, and I thought that was really great. Um, so I, that I had sent it to, and I know we've had a lot going on, so, but it, it so just. So you're talking about an extra level beyond publicly posting, like a post emails out to. Mrs. Vi, if I may suggest a bylaw 139, which is coming up, deal specifically with agenda. Is that maybe where you would want to put it? That might make more okay. sense. If we, okay. if we want to get down there, we could probably suggest that there. <clears throat> There are no further questions on Appendix B. I'm going to move on to Bylaw 118. By one law, Bylaw 118 has to do with the election of the officers of the school board, which is the chair and the vice chair. As I mentioned it in the standing rules that actually set out some of the procedures, some of the procedures were set here, but there were specific sections of the procedure that were not here and could only be found in the standing rules. So I've gone ahead under Section 1 now and added those two sections that you we just removed from the standing um, rules. So they would appear here in Bylaw 118. That would be the only change other than uh, numbering on this particular bylaw. Are there any questions on Bylaw 118? If no questions on bylaw 118, I'll move on to bylaw 139. Uh, uh, just to uh, interrupt one second, Ms. Owens does have her hand raised. Please go ahead, Ms. Owens. Hi. Um, and actually, it's been raised for a little bit. I just wanted to be able to make the comment in regards to the um, public comment sign-up that uh, I certainly would not be opposed to having the public uh, sign up for comments last longer than noon the day before. I, I do understand the need to have a cutoff time and enough time for preparations to be made. Um, but I, I certainly wouldn't be opposed to giving the most time that we can while still being reasonable to have public uh, commenting. I do like the idea of having the agenda sent out to parents in advance, but that's kind of separate. Um, I would love to see it pushed at least till the end of the day or till 9 a.m. the morning of. So I just wanted to put that out there. Day of the meeting. So today at noon we, we cut we it off. The list. So it's the day of the meeting. It's not the day before. Okay. I mean, if that's the, the 
helps us that we feel like we can get it and still manage to do what we need to do, then I, I understand it. But if we can have it closer, I, I do think that there's value in giving people as much time as possible to have their input heard. So. If you go up to like three o'clock and you start a four o'clock meeting, you know, as well as I do, that you are in there talking to the clerk at three o'clock. Uh, most of you are in there in the building. So you got to be careful. There's a lot. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just pointing out that there's a little bit more to this and um, you understand how soon you all learn here. And most times you have workshop at four o'clock. So we're talking a couple hours on there, but it does take, I know we've got four or five people of us working together to get this done and it does take a bit of time to get it done. But that's the thing we can talk again in PRC if you want to talk, we can meet that at the next PRC meeting. Okay, understood, thank you. A PRC, are you willing to take willing another to look at this? Please proceed, Mrs. Linetti. 139 is the agenda preparations on here, and this talks about Section A, notification of meetings, um, B, supporting documentation, C, agenda items, D, is or, uh, in organizational agenda preparation, and we would be adding Section E, which again takes out the, puts the criteria for school board awards, recognitions, and criteria for students, employees, and the public. Again, obviously, you can't recognize every award that's out there, so this has been a long-term section that was in your standing bylaws. We just removed it from um, Appendix B that I showed you earlier, and we're going to pop it back here in the agenda planning so you know which agenda items would go in there. And so those terms will be set forth there. Now, Mrs. Manning, what you're suggesting here about notification about the agenda items that might be more appropriate in this bylaw, something to about notifying the public? Yeah. I, um, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to, to send the... Um, the example to the whole board for you to take a look at it and maybe have policy review committee consider that um, if everyone would be agreeable to that. Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. There are no further questions on 139. I think we'll go on to 147. If I'm correct, that's the next one. Yes, 147 is public comments at school board meetings. Sections broken down. Section A is presentation to the school board. Section B is advanced request procedure on there. Uh, again, talks about the sign-up time period. We remove the sign-up limitations that you saw in Appendix B. We put them here. And then uh, noting on here that the school board has the right to alter the order of speakers. We've done that normally. You would just take them in the order they sign up. Last couple of meetings, we've been taking in-person people before um, before Zoom people. I'm not sure how long we'll keep doing that, but we left that restriction in there. Again, this is where you see the time limitation with the recommendation is to drop it from four to three. Section D had to do with documents. We used to have a requirement that if you wanted documents or things to be considered, it had to be turned in seven days on there. This is pretty old. This is from the time period where we used to make hard copies for you. We'd have to send them out and take them out. We would deliver them to you on Thursdays and Fridays. Nowadays, that doesn't make as much sense, and there's so many other ways electronically we could get it for you. So the, po the policy review committee decided we didn't even need this section anymore. D has to do with the public hearings on there, um, which are scheduled public hearings that we have. We're just adding the word, the sentence, the school board or superintendent or designee may create procedures to address the orderly presentation of speakers. Rather than having to come to you, which I've had to a couple times the last month, ask how you wanted to do it, we just suggest that you let us go ahead and figure out how we're going to organize them and how we're going to bring them in and just put that in the, in the bylaw. Are there any questions on 147? Mrs. Manning. Um, just to clarify, it says the school board reserves the right to alter the order of the speaker. So the school board, that would mean all of us would have to vote to alter the order? You can designate this. Or, and I, I know it, last time you all decided for the July 28th meeting that you wanted and you voted that uh, in the meeting that you wanted the um, speaker to, or you can designate it to uh, the governance committee or the superintendent to alter that. I mean, is there, I'm just trying to think, I mean, this is kind of wide open. I understand the reason for the Zoom part, you know, why we would want to alter the order, but, you know, what if somebody says, well, you know, I like this group over that group, and I'm going to let them speak first. That would apply here too, right? It would have to be the school board, a majority of the school board voting to so, do that. So it would have to be a majority of the school board. Actually, because it's a bylaw, it'd have to be two-thirds. Okay. All right. Thank you. 
Um, and I, again, on this one, I disagree with the time limitation. The note for the questions on 147. Moving on, this will not be bylaws. This is policy 332. Again, the policy review committee is trying to finish off section three, which we've been working on for the better part of a year. This has to do with our business and non instructional operations. This recommendation came to us from the um, director of procurement on uh, there, and his suggestion is under section B. Now, policy 332 is emergency small sole source purchases, section B is small purchases, professional service contracts. The uh, director of person came down and spoke with the policy review committee, and he said, while looking through all their contracts, there's a small amount of contracts ex, um, below $100,000 uh, that he did not feel were necessary for competition because there simply wasn't competition out there. He, he went through the list for us. It's actually a very small group in there, and he's listed the general categories, which is instructional materials. Uh, instructional software, digital certain assessment tests, and industry standard certifications where there really was no competition. He said that he's recommending that those categories be exempted from that because they was spending a lot of resources trying to find competition that didn't exist. That seemed to make sense to the policy review committee, so they agreed to make that amendment to the policy, and that would be the only changes we're recommending to policy 332. There are no questions on that. I'll move on to policy 389, also in the business and non-instructional operations section. This has to do with general contract execution policy. Game again came to us from the director of um, purchasing and very small change under section C, which is contract review and approval. Section four is availability of funds. It read, except as an exception of the policy, every contract exceeding used to be five thousand dollars shall be signed initial for availability of funds by the director of the Office of Business Services, um, he suggested that that was no longer consistent with what the law is. There have been changes to the procurement law on the amount, and he's suggesting that we move it up to 10000 Also, the following sentence also moves the amount up to 10000 We did a recommendation in one of the policies under the consent section also moved that up to 10000 He's just asking that we amend that to reflect the same um, contract limit that we put in there. You'll see the same limit on $10,000 put in Section E and contracting authority for schools and departments. Again, those have been changes that have come to the procurement law in the last couple of years, and he wanted to reflect that. So the only changes here would be moving the dollar amount in certain categories from 10000 to 5000 from 5000 to 10000 And with that, I believe that the end of the recommendations of the Policy Review Committee for this month. Any further questions? All right. Thank you, Mrs. Linetti and, and the committee. So that brings us back to, uh, to Dr. Bergen. Uh, we're going to have an abbreviated presentation on updates on the reopening of schools. We had a two-hour presentation work during the workshop for the public who would like to go back and, and view the recording of that. But we'll do our best here to bring everybody up to speed who missed the first round. And I know, colleagues, we, we have a queue of questions to remaining. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I I will speak quickly so that we can get back to your questions. And again, I will be providing an abbreviated version of the full workshop. So good evening to you again, Mrs. Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, members of the board, Dr. Spence. <clears throat> again, to allow sufficient time to address all of the board members' questions, I'm going to be the only presenter on this information item rather than bring all of our chief officers to the podium. And I will only be summarizing the information that was shared during the workshop. So for any members of the public who are viewing now who are unable to be present for the workshop presentation, there will be a recording available on our division website. As I did at the start of the workshop, I'm going to very quickly review for you the current health metrics, summarize the final results of the student registration process, speak to our current status on our scheduling efforts, provide a high-level summary of our operational and facilities planning efforts, as well as our professional learning offerings for teachers. And I'll touch upon some of our uh, more recent and planned network and instructional technology enhancements, talk a bit about the safe learning centers, and then get back to your questions. This is a screenshot from the Virginia Department of Health website from today that indicates percent positivity for the Eastern region over the past five months, as indicated on the screen, has dropped from its high at 12.2 on July 18 to a current level of 8.4%. 
which is a decrease of 1.3% uh, down from 9.7 just two weeks ago. And this is another screenshot from the Virginia Department of Health website from today that indicates the number of new cases for COVID-19 in the eastern region also has continued to drop. As indicated by the Goldenrod line, since reaching a high of 483 cases in late July, the number of new cases now stands at 218, which is squarely in the yellow zone by our metrics, down from 350 cases just two weeks ago. This slide is a summary of the final results of the student registration verification process for all students. We were able to achieve a completion rate of 92%, which includes 53% of our families in favor of face-to-face -face instruction, and 39% with a preference for virtual instruction for the first semester. The 8% of the students whose parents didn't complete the process will be added by default to option one. So our end result will be 61% of our students being scheduled for face-to-face -face instruction when safe to do so, and 39% for virtual. And this slide contains a summary of the student registration verification process by level and by school to highlight the great variability of the results with a low of 36% for in-person instruction at the elementary level up through a high of 80%. At the middle school level, similarly a low of 39% to a high of 79% and the high school level with a range of 49 to 79% for in-person instruction. As Dr. Robertson noted during the workshop, we're nearing the end of our student and staff scheduling and assignment process. School staff have worked tire tirelessly to complete a process in less than 10 days that they would normally take three to four months to complete, which has added to the anxiety of our teachers, principals, students, and families. Also, as noted by Dr. Robertson, we have made some adjustments to the plan for the VLC in order to keep as many students and teachers from a single school together. For a deeper explanation as to the evolution of the VLC, I would direct you back to Dr. Robertson's comments during the workshop. This Thursday, we will be releasing to all teachers their teaching assignments and schedules. There will be personal conversations occurring between administrators and teachers about any changes in any expected assignments. On Friday uh, of this week, we will be mailing to the elementary school parents schedules for their children. So elementary school aged Parents of elementary school aged children should be looking to receive those by next Wednesday. If they've not received them, they should contact their child's school. Secondary schools will be completing the student schedules by the end of this week and will then upload them into parent view and student view for viewing. Over the coming weeks, students will continue to, I'm sorry, schools will continue to accept, process, and place students into classes. We will give the families of new enrollees the choice of enrolling in option one or two, and we will honor all of those preferences as possible. As of today, schools are drawing closer to having all of their teacher vacancies filled. Regarding operational facilities updates, this slide includes examples of the many different types of signage we'll be posting in all of our schools. The Office of Facility Services, and specifically our building managers, are working with the administrators in every school to help arrange classrooms for proper social distancing of students and to design traffic flow at school entrances and throughout the school building. Mr. Freeman will be the host this Thursday evening for our next series in the hashtag VB Safe Together uh, sessions to elaborate on how we are planning to keep students and staff safe when they return to our schools for in-person instruction. Next, regarding in-person return of designated groups of students with disabilities, as indicated in our VBCPS instructional plan, designated groups of students with disabilities may begin in-person instruction even when the identified health metrics for the Eastern Region are in a combination of red or red and yellow for percent positivity and cases by date. This would be no different than when we brought students in this summer for ESY. Therefore, students with disabilities under IDEA who require intensive supports may return earlier than other student groups. IEP meetings will be held with all students with disabilities to include students who require these intensive supports to return them to face-to-face -face instruction earlier than other student groups. Our Office of Programs for Exceptional Children staff will be available to support school staff with these IEP meetings. Also during the workshop, Dr. Rogers 
provided extensive information about the professional development for teachers regarding uh, the professional development for teachers to assist them with virtual instruction. This professional development began in March when we implemented the continuity of learning and the emergency learning plan. Over the summer, we hosted a virtual learning camp for over 1,200 teachers. And professional development continues this week and beyond for all teachers on best practices for virtual learning, including training in Schoology, building online communities, using digital whiteboards, teaching in the 4x4, culturally responsive practices, and much more. Dr. Shoebridge shared during the workshop that we will be using Seesaw primarily for grades K-2 to enhance communication between students, teachers, and parents. And of course, Schoology will continue to be an important resource for all of our students and teachers. In addition, we will be using Securely this year to allow teachers to easily monitor their students' Chromebooks during live instruction. We're introducing this year a, a new piece of software called ClassLink. This is in response to the many concerns raised by parents over the spring about having too many applications to manage for their children. ClassLink will provide a single sign-on platform to allow students, parents, and staff to safely and securely access all of the digital resources necessary with a single username and password. ClassLink also improves upon the clever login experience that our students and staff would be familiar with by providing a more streamlined, personalized point of entry to online applications and resources. ClassLink places into a virtual hashtag backpack all of the applications students would need to access for their virtual learning assignments. In support of these instructional technology improvements, during the workshop, Mr. Din shared some of the improvements that are being made by our Department of Technology to our network. For instance, we are working now on extending Wi-Fi access on all of our school campuses to allow for outdoor learning spaces. We are purchasing a division-wide Zoom license so that all teachers will have access to this popular tool without restrictions and which will allow them to record their classes for students to view later. And the Department of Technology is extending their staff hours to provide even further live support for our students and their parents into the evenings until 6.30 p.m. Monday through Thursday. Another major enhancement planned is the purchase of an additional 250 interactive panels for classrooms to replace the older projector style boards and which offer much brighter picture quality and improved sound. These new panels will be prioritized for secondary classrooms and for those unique instructional environments throughout our schools where there is a singleton teacher for a course. A large screen will facilitate much easier video conferencing for teachers who opt to teach their virtual students from the classroom and when students return return for in-person instruction. These larger screens will allow those in-person students to interact and collaborate with their peers who are online. And finally, new larger screen laptops, ideal for video conferencing, have been ordered for all of our teachers. We've also placed orders for iPads for all of our pre-kindergarten students. However, as Mr. Din shared, due to high demand by basically every school division in the country, these laptops and iPads are on back order. We expect to receive them in October and have them distributed to teachers and students in November. Next, as was shared during the workshop, the work of a joint city and schools task force that included stakeholders from across the city, such as Parks and Rec, Hampton Road Chamber, United Way, Head Start, and the Interfaith Alliance, has led to the creation of safe learning centers. The purpose of these safe learning centers is to ensure student safety for children who would otherwise be home alone during the school day, with priority being given to children of VBCPS teachers and essential employees of the city, including first responders, and then to low-income students. While attending a safe learning center, students will receive academic support, mentoring, enrichment, meals, and recreational activities. The centers will operate in most of our elementary schools at no cost for VBCPS parents, except at those sites operated by Parks and Recreation, which will be offering extended hours. Most of the centers will operate from eight to three to closely match a regular school day, while the sites operated by Parks and Rec will provide extended hours between 6.30 a.m. and 6 p.m. Students will be monitored during the day by VBCPS employees who otherwise do not have a work assignment during periods of virtual instruction. 
Lastly, the Child Care Task Force has created an interactive, interactive child care locator map, which will go live on our VBS, VBCPS website to assist families in locating child care providers across the city. And one more plug, please join us this Thursday from 6 to 7, as Mr. Freeman will be hosting the next in a series of our VB Safe Together uh, opportunities. The focus this Thursday will be on building, being safe in and out of the classroom. We hope everyone will be able to join us this Thursday. I hope that was fast enough for you, Madam Chair. And with that, let's get back to your questions. Sounds good, thank you. Okay, uh, Madam, Madam Chair, I, I left everybody in the queue um, where we left off. So Owens, Edwards, Riggs, Anderson, and to add to that, just let me know, but that's where we left off. Wonderful. Can we check to see if Miss Owens is available? Miss Owens, you're available for questions. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. Um, so my first question, and I understand it's kind of a, a two or three parter. I wanted to get more information about the uh, breakdowns of uh, option one versus option two on the uh, schools. We had a, a, obviously Dr. Bergen sent the full list out to us in an email and I just saw a kind of summary on the screen when we did it. Um, what, I guess not, it didn't stick out to me, it was what I expected, but I guess what was reinforced for me by the list is that the five lowest schools um, who all were in the 20% range uh, for face-to-face -face, uh, choice, uh, Newtown, College Park, SeaTac, Diamond Springs, and Holland, all Title I schools, all um, you know, low-income students, are, uh, higher populations there, higher populations of minority students, the top five uh, that chose the face-to-face uh, -face option Thoroughgood, Kingston, John B. Dye, Trantwood, Creed, um, obviously not Title I schools. In fact, no Title I schools in the ranking through the first 26 choosing uh, the face-to-face -face option as their uh, preference. Uh, so I, I wanted to know a couple of things. How we're addressing schools with 80% or more who chose face-to-face -face while maintaining the social distancing in the schools. and uh, what challenges are we expecting with transitioning um, from virtual to face-to-face -to -face now that the VLC has uh, been adapted and not running as originally explained, particularly in the schools uh, with these uh, on both ends of the, the spectrum there? So Ms. Owens, uh, I'm gonna take a shot at that. Uh, in terms of your first question related to how are we uh, addressing these schools that had really over 75% of the students who chose in-person learning? Um, we've, we have gone through those schools with uh, school division services to ensure that we can place all the students in the classrooms uh, with at least three feet of distance between them. We've also, in a couple of situations, identified some other learning spaces within the school that we can utilize, i.e. the library, uh, the cafeteria could be a learning space. The gymnasium could be a learning space. So we can accommodate all the schools um, with the students that we have coming in based upon option one. Um, your, your second question was related to transitioning kids in from there. Is that correct? Sorry, I got stuck on mute. Yes. Um, how the, the transition... I'm not really clear on how the children are um, divvied out into their uh, assigned teachers, uh, the ones who've chosen virtual versus the ones who have chosen face-to-face, -face, and if that is expected to change um, as kids go into the buildings for the face-to-face. -face. Okay, so uh, when we pivoted from the original plan of creating two separate schools, a central support a virtual learning center and a and a home school for option one. Um, in doing so and and working through the schedules over the last week, we recognize that 
at this particular juncture, we needed to put uh, extra students in some option one classes. And the way that we're doing that is, let's say, for example, we, have, we can put 21 seats in a class. So we have 21 students in that class who chose option one. We have added some students to that class who are going to be option two students. So that class, since it's starting virtually, may have 26 or 27 students originally. But once we pivot to face-to-face, -to -face, there's a number of those students that we have placed into that class to get the year going that will then pivot into a what could be a central uh, VLC classroom or could pivot into another teacher's classroom. And we have that situation because we're trying to maximize our staff, uh, our existing staff that we have within the division. We also have some schools and clusters partnering together. So for example, we had a situation with a one elementary school who needed to uh, have 22 in a class to make a full class. They had 16 students. Just so happens one of their neighboring schools in the same grade level had six students, but not enough for a class. So those two schools got together. Now they have a virtual class of 22. I think the number is 22. That's going to be taught by a teacher at one of the schools. That allows us to maximize both of those teachers by sharing students in a virtual environment from two schools. So we've had to be very creative to, again, meet uh, our goal to try to keep as many kids and teachers together in the same school and again maximize the existing staff that we have. Okay so without there being an official VLC some students will remain with teachers from their original school and some students will pivot to teachers from a different school at some point during the first nine weeks. Yes. Okay. Um, when we were here last time and we talked about uh, the VLC, one of the big selling points was that no teachers would be forced to come back to a classroom because there's such a need for the VLC teachers and we're going to be recruiting them. Um, are we still at that same um, standpoint? I would say without, without being able to quantify that across 86 sites, I think that's the norm. We had far more students who requested option two than teachers who noted a preference for option two. But you do get into specific situations, particularly the secondary level, where I'm a French teacher, so to speak, and I'm the only French teacher in the school. Um, and although I prefer option two, so to speak, I don't have and I haven't submitted the necessary documentation of, of significant health risk, so I may need to teach an option one at the school because I'm the only French teacher. So we'll, we, do, we will get in some unique situations based upon uh, the, what subject the teachers um, have certification in and student needs. So that will occur. But for the most part, we are keeping teachers who noted a preference in option two in option two because the numbers are there. So for the most part, but there will be some who have to teach face to face, even though they requested not to. Yes. Okay. Um, I will let uh, somebody else go and then I'll maybe come back and have a couple more. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Mr. Edwards and then Mrs. Riggs. How are you? Mrs. Riggs. <laughs> Okay, um, so um, Mrs. Owens asked a lot of the questions I was thinking about, but there is one question, or two questions, and I, these are for you, uh, Dr. Robertson. Um, you're talking about pivoting. Do you have an idea how many students you're going to have to pivot? I mean, I know that uh, Joe Burnsworth is working with this with you. Um, so that when the time comes, you're ready to move these students into that central deal. Yeah. So do you have an idea how I'll, much, how many? I'll know Friday. You'll know Friday? Yes. Okay. The, all right. So the other question, and basically this is the biggest question I've had the entire time since we've been getting all these feedbacks is, feedback is um, the bottom line is, are we going to be ready? 
Are you going to have everything you need to open the schools when you say you are? September 8th, mm -hmm. yes. You're going to be ready? Yes. All students will have a schedule by the end of the week. Uh, teacher assignments go out Thursday. Um, secondary schools have through the end of the day Friday to finish their student schedules. We're doing daily check-ins. And although they are not finished yet, they are on the back end of the process. And so on Monday, we will be able to have schedules and parent view and student view for um, families to view. I, I would be remiss not to be completely honest and say that in every year that I was ran a school as a principal, there were always some tweaks that needed to be made. I mean, I would run my schedule at, at Salem and, and it would be 97%. We would go in there and make some tweaks, but invariably that first week, little Johnny had uh, two English classes on different days, and it's like, oh, how did that happen? Or, you know, little Johnny is in the algebra class that he just passed last year. Those checks will be done next week by the counselors. Well, that brings another question. You just made me think about it. Um, you said as a principal. Yes. So um, are your principals going to be ready? Yes. They're going to be ready too? Yes. Okay, thank We're you. We're doing daily check-ins. We have some pretty candid conversations. Uh, there, most of them worked last Saturday, and there will be some that are working this Saturday. I'm sure there'll be many. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Please add Miss Weems to the queue. She has her hand raised. Will do. Okay, Mrs. Melnick, and then Mrs. Anderson. Um, I just wanted to apologize to the public. Um, we we had a lot of people that came and spoke tonight that were led to believe that there was going to be a vote tonight. And that simply was not true. And um, I apologize for that. I, I think that this board just needed a gut check. And um, there were a thousand questions among this board, with these board members. There were thousands of questions with our teachers and our parents. And um, I appreciate this being on information so that we can spend this extra time all together like this and presenting this to the community um, this way. This was really, really important. So thank you to Mrs. Riggs for having this added. Thank you for adding it. And thank you, staff, for giving us this time to really um, delve into these very, um, you know, deep questions that, um, you know, it's, it, it's different. It's different this year, and it's scary this year on, on many levels, and everybody needed this tonight. So as, as the clock is ticking and we're getting closer, so thank you. Can I, can I just add to what she said, and just to say why I wanted, at, wanted it added to the agenda, is because there was so much questions. And every time I asked people that were speaking to me, have you gone online? Did you listen to the VB Safe uh, workshops, the virtual? And many of them were like, oh, no, I didn't have time. You know, because a lot of the questions could have been answered by watching that. Uh, I watched it. So I, th and then, of course, we're getting the, the emails from administration that parents and teachers aren't getting, obviously. And that's, that's for various reasons, obvious, obvious reasons. So that was... As as Kim said, it was for a gut check. We needed to make sure. So thank you. If I may add, though, I mean, it's it's not uncommon to have a topic discussed both at the workshop and the meet in the formal meeting. My concern is the chair, and this is for the public. There was nothing on the agenda that indicated a vote was scheduled. We have to encourage the public. I just encourage you. The agenda is the official agenda for the meeting and and I just it's always posted the Thursday before the meeting please refer to that if you hear that there's a vote that you didn't think that was going to happen go back and check our agenda so I mean I, I feel as bad as anybody that there was misconception out in the community but it never came from any official school division or school board communication so I, I can't say it more simply than that so thank you. Okay, Mrs. Were we Anderson. okay, Mrs. Anderson? Actually, I was the one who added it as information first. I beg your pardon. <laughs> for the same reasons, though, 
was because we were getting so many questions and I just felt it was really, really necessary to have it added as information. Uh, not only did we need it in the workshop, because as you can see, we had a lot of questions tonight that we that we needed answers to. Uh, but but I wanted it to be on the agenda so that people would have an opportunity to come and and voice their concerns. Uh, and then we would have another opportunity to after after the workshop to digest some of the information we, we received. And then if we had any additional questions, we could also answer those as get those answers as well. But I also want to say thank you to um, the administration for working so hard. We know that you guys are working overtime and, and we appreciate all that you're putting into this. The biggest thing that I would like some answers to though is um, that it hasn't been really um, elaborated on a whole lot is could you please elaborate more on this the schedule changes that have been made. Uh, we haven't heard a lot about that although I've heard some I got some emails from people who were concerned uh, especially up at the middle school times um, because those are the last ones to start so it could you elaborate on that please um, I, I was away last week and also had email problems and so I may have missed it maybe it was in there but you know it was like news to me so I, I would like some more information about that please certainly the uh, schedule daily schedule that were released last Thursday were developed in consultation between school leadership and school division services, particularly transportation. As you know, um, David Pace has some restrictions on transportation that he's shared in here often. It's also going to be incredibly important uh, that his drivers have a chance to safely traverse their various routes and also be able to take the time to clean and disinfect their buses. And in doing so, there was a, uh, uh, some triggers of additional time needed between runs and we're on a four tier system. And so by the time you got to the last tier, it was pushed back 30 minutes. So rather than having a 930 to 4 uh, schedule like we had last year, it's 10 to 430. And, and so that's, that's really the, the, the driver of the schedule. Okay. That's actually better than what I had heard. Uh, and, and then my last part as a follow-up to that was you said that the, um, the safe learning centers, they stop at 3 o'clock. Is that correct? So what about those teachers who, whose students don't leave until 3.30, 4 o'clock? Um, what about their, you know, because we're giving priority to our BBCBS staff for their students. So what about those teachers who, or is this only during virtual learning time only? Is that, yes. So once, is once we return thing. elementary school students to in-person instruction, the safe learning centers no longer exist. Okay, that, that clarifies that. Thank you. Okay, and they're, they're 8 to 3 in most sites, but for folks that need a longer period of time, Parks and Rec is, is operating in about half of the sites, 6.30 to 6. That's, okay. that's $80 a child per week, no charge at the sites that we're offering for our employees. So they can basically bring their children with them while they, while they complete their virtual instruction. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Dr. Bergen, $80 a week. Eight sounded great, but it's 80. <laughs> eight, that may be my mask. Yeah. <laughs> eight, eight, zero. Correct. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Mine, I think, is a cupcake question. <laughs> In terms of distributing the schedules, so the secondary, it says, will be available online. Right, parent view, student view. Yes. Why are elementary schedules mailed as opposed to being posted online? Uh, the, my team felt like to reach more of the parents uh, at the elementary level, we would stick to a process that they're very familiar with, which is mailing the schedules. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then would those be ultimately posted as well, the mailing, the, the, the elementary knowing, and know with, with all due respect to the post office and my brother's employee, but it's not what, you know, it, it just things do get lost in the mail. Yeah, and so that's why I, I said tonight, and Dr. Bergen reiterated it, uh, because we do know there's some stressors on the U.S. Postal Service right now that if, if elementary school parents 
have not received their schedule by Wednesday next week to go ahead and contact their school and we Great. can make it available to them at that okay, point. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And uh, so getting back to VLC. <laughs> so just so I, I so when it, when we start off it's not going to be wh what is what are we calling it at, at, from the get-go so we're all of our our students are going to start virtually on september the 8th right and so i you know i, I think um and, and i understand this people have gotten really hung up in the term virtual learning center thinking mindset chesapeake it's completely disconnected from the home schools it's, it's really a central repository of kids run like a summer school program. Their numbers were much smaller, um, which is not what we had in, in our division. So our, our students are going to be participating in a virtual learning environment where they're just going to be attached to their home school. So we kind of coined the phrase home-based virtual learning center which will be up and running immediately. And at the point we have the phased in face to face, will will the name will the name change, or we haven't gotten that far it, yet? It's what not. we're going to call it. <laughs> no, it will not. So th and that's a that's a very good question. So let's say all things are are good and all the metrics work out, and we can start the clock September eighth, and we're pivoting back into school two weeks later. Uh, those students will that are in that virtual setting will be in that vert that same virtual setting when they pivot back into school. What we'll be able to know Friday and start working on next week is where are those classes that are offset with too many kids? And then where are our teachers that we can do some... In any year as a master scheduler, you would look at your schedule and do some balancing to try to, to equal out the load, so to speak. We don't know what that looks like until all the schedules are done. So next week, centrally, we can start looking with Joe Burnsworth and Barbara Sessoms, who are going to oversee those two programs. Where are the students that we're going to need to identify to serve in the central base VLC? And then where are the staff that we need to identify to serve those students in the central base VLC? So initially, there will be students participating in a virtual learning environment attached to, to a home school. And as we, again, work out all those numbers, there will be a central supported VLC instituted at some point in time in the first quarter. Okay. Yep. And I, I know this goes back to, Ms. I think Mr. Freeman, it's not a question, but a comment, but I was reassured Thank you for reassuring with the schools with those high return to school numbers. You know what I'm talking yes. Those, a lot of them happen to be in my district. And so I, that's what I was hoping to hear, that you're using other space within the building because some of those numbers are pretty high. Yes. Right. Okay. All right. So Mrs. Holtz and then Ms. Owens. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to kind of present a scenario because, uh, because a lot of questions need to be answered. Uh, let's suppose it's September, September 22nd and every, some of the people are virtual learning and the other people are face to face. Everything's great. We're yellow, yellow. And all of a sudden on a Wednesday afternoon, the metric changes and it's red. How do teachers get notified? So I'm assuming according to our plan, we're going to close. How do parents get notified? How do teachers get notified? Because that's going to be a tremendous difference in parents' life, and there's a little bit of a problem there. Uh, and is the transition going to go smoothly with the teachers? Do adaptations need to be made? So maybe you can answer that all in one ball. Yeah, so I, and I, I think the general if I understand your question, it's it's the, you know, it's a rapid, or we're concerned that there might be a rapid change, and how right. does that communication and very well there might be. So um, you've seen the updates that Dr. Bergen has provided uh, recently, and while there is a potential that there could be a rapid change in from yellow to red, you've noticed you can kind of see a trend that that goes with it. 
Um, so we, we anticipate that the most likely outcome if it went in that direction is we would see a trend and we would be, begin to be able to communicate, prepare everybody mentally for when that potential transition might occur if that trend continues. So uh, to kind of what your question is, our intention is to continue to monitor the data on a regular basis. We are very well connected with the Virginia Department of Health. So even when it's not necessarily showing up there, we have good communications to see if, all right, is it moving in a direction that we should be communicating with our public about? And if we see that, we will communicate and give as much heads up as we can. If there's a rapid change, we will make sure that we have a very thorough discussion at the leadership level of how do we make a smooth transition to a different learning environment. Well, uh, take the opposite case then. We're all going to go virtual September 8th for two weeks. Suppose at the end of that two weeks, because it's after Labor Day and we have discussed it, that there is a spike. Would we all just stay virtual? So if we, have a, if we get into a red indication, right. um, if we go back into the red, during that period of time, that the waiting, which is why it's in there, we would not return to face-to-face -face instruction if during that two-week period of time we got back into the red. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Can I, can okay. I do a quick follow-up on it? Sure, Mr. You know, Dr. Spence and I had a discussion on this earlier, and, and, and as a follow-up to, to that, even if we're in the yellow on the 22nd, um, if we're if we're already seeing a, a bad trend, um, we're not automatically going back just because we're in the yellow. Is that correct, Dr. Spence? Can you elaborate? Yeah, I think I think what we have to do is we have to monitor and and try to understand what the data is telling us, right? And so you know, to the point, if it's post Labor Day and we start to see a dramatic upturn then we're not going to sort of, you know, doggedly say, no, we're going back no matter what. We're going to be looking at that data and trying to understand what it's telling us and, importantly, be working with the Department of Health to understand what their recommendations are based on that trending data and, and with, our, with our physician advisors that have agreed to continue to work with us. So, so um, right, I mean, it isn't – these are metrics to guide us, and uh, – and as we've kind of said in the middle there, when we're in yellow, as the trends begin to go downwards, we may begin to bring more students back to school, even if we're not in green. And it would work the other way around. If the trends are going upwards, we may not bring students back to school right away. We need to watch and see what the data is telling us and, and what the full picture is um, all around us as well. And so, um, but I think it's very important to, to understand what those full pictures are and to be very careful about what we're looking at and, how, and what we're comparing and so we will we will certainly be doing all of that okay is, is this related to before okay, okay and then we'll get to miss owens you're you're on you're next <laughs> on deck <laughs> so dr spence i know that everybody's been saying here all your senior staff has been saying that we're going to be ready we're going to be ready we're going to be ready is there any scenario that you can think of where you might have to intervene where we're just not quite ready on September 22nd? So <clears throat> right now we're planning as if we are going to, uh, well, we know 100% we, know we are opening school on September the 8th, and we know what that looks like. And we are planning full steam ahead in preparation to be open face-to-face -face as early as September the 22nd. Um, and, to, but, and to give you a very honest assessment, I will be in a much better position. So you heard Dr. Robertson talk about by the end of the week, we'll have schedules. I will be in a much better position, certainly within two weeks, but, but, but probably within a week to be able to answer your question with absolute certainty that within two weeks of the opening of school, we will be ready to pivot to face-to-face -to -face instruction to, to answer that with absolute certainty. I feel we're planning for that. I feel confident about that. But there are issues that we are working through, and that includes scheduling. Um, staffing is an issue. Budget is an issue. Um, you all probably have heard through the budget updates um, that the General Assembly is looking at a, a significant reduction to schools funding. Uh, and that's directly associated with sales tax reduction. Um, that sort of thing limits flexibility uh, in terms of what we're able to do to respond to certain things. So we have to work through 
um, that and uh, address some new requirements that have just come to our attention from the state regarding virtual instruction. Um, and then you heard Mr. Freeman talking a little bit about looking at um, physical distancing and some of the structures that we need to put in place to, um, to, protect, to, to protect around that. And so uh, I, I feel very confident we, we will be ready. I'll be in a much better position within a week, uh, certainly no more than two weeks to tell you precisely what that will look like. And uh, I say with absolute confidence, um, to, to go back to earlier comments um, and ongoing comments, that we, we would certainly not need nine weeks to not be ready, so, or, or to be ready. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. So you're not, you're saying that we, we certainly don't need nine weeks, but there is. I mean, I think all through this, and, and we have to just be, you know, continuing to honestly assess with one another where we are, right? So all through this, everything is new. Everything is new. We're trying to figure it out. You all have hundreds of questions. We have hundreds of questions. We're answering those questions. I think you saw tonight the remarkable degree to which my team is able to answer the questions mm -hmm. that come up so that we know that we can be prepared to bring students back. But I also, I, you know, I have the obligation to give you my best assessment and to say to you, yeah, with confidence, we'll be open, kids will be there, everything will work, it'll work great, the staffing will be in place, the schedules will be done uh, for the face-to-face -face versus the virtual, everything will be done. Um, based on the fact that we're still dealing with scheduling, and that will help us understand the staffing issues, and I have to work through the budget conversation that we have to have about some of that because we, we understand we may need additional staff, I can't say to you today, we'll be good to go. I can say to you that I think within a week, I can say that for sure. Um, and I have high, a high degree of confidence because the team continues to rise to the challenge. I have a high degree of confidence that that will continue. Um, but, you know, to the point, it's, it, I'm not going to sit here and give you a dishonest assessment. I'm going to tell you that's what I think needs to happen. Then Within about a week, I can tell you for sure after we start finalizing the scheduling conversation. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Owens. Okay. Um, I just had uh, like two other questions. With the um, changing of teachers for the children who were virtual in option two once uh, school starts for face-to-face, -face, um, is it anticipated that if at whatever point we need to go virtual again, that those students would be staying with the teachers if they have pivoted to, or are we expecting them to have to change teachers again if they were to go back for virtual? No, no, Ms. Owens. If, if, if the students that we have to make an adjustment to, as we work out the schedule piece and uh, institute the central-based VLC, uh, they would not get another schedule change. So we're expecting them to have the one-time schedule changes. And this is going to affect students primarily who chose the virtual option? Yes. Okay. That's kind of concerning for parents, I, I will say myself included, who chose option two to try and avoid teacher changes um, and then to find out that we are actually the most likely to have teacher changes, particularly when we're looking at the numbers in the different schools and we're saying that this is primarily going to affect our Title I students, um, our minority students, and our low-income students more than any other students in our division. But I guess at this point, so we're not voting on I think a couple of things there, Ms. Owens, uh, and it's, it's Aaron Spence. Um, one, I think when you have more students who are opting in for the virtual, then as we schedule staff from those schools to try to be with those students, it's more likely those students will actually stay with their, their homeschool teacher in the virtual environment. So um, so that, that would be the, the response to the latter part of that. To the first part, yeah, I agree with you. I'm certain it's concerning. If there's anything about any of this that's not concerning to anybody, I'm, I'll, I'll be floored. But the reality is we're doing our level-headed best to get school open for children, to provide options to parents, and to bring kids back as safely as possible in ways that we know we can do. And, and so 
there's this kind of perception out here, and I've talked about this before, and I'm just going to keep saying it, that somehow things should be perfect in order for things to go forward. And that simply isn't the reality that we're living in. It isn't the reality in Virginia Beach. It isn't the reality across the country. It's certainly not the reality in the region. It's just not fundamentally true that things are going to be perfect or anything like previous school years. And anybody who thought it would be is, is simply not paying attention. And, and, and so it's not to dismiss that it's concerning because, you know, I, I'm a, I mean, I, I, don't, I know I talk about this. I haven't talked about this much during this. I'm a father of six. Four of them are in our system. Many of our board members have friends and grandchildren and children in the system. Almost everybody on my senior staff either has a child in the system or is married to a teacher in the system. All of us understand how complicated this is, and none of us are not concerned by what the school year is going to look like. I, I have spoken candidly to people about the challenges my own family has faced in the virtual learning environment, my desire for the, my children to be back, but my concerns about that. And, and, and I'm you know, concerned for, for my children who would be in the virtual environment and then end up with a different teacher as well. And I will also say, all of these things also happen during regular school years. We balance teacher loads and we move children in September and October across our schools every school year. We have children who transition in and out of our schools every year and have new teachers, military children on a regular basis, as you all know, who come in and out of our buildings and they change, they cause us to balance our loads and change teachers. So it's just, yes, it's concerning, but if we let the re if we let things that are concerning stop us from moving forward, we, we're just simply not gonna move forward. And, and we have to move forward. Okay. Um, and I agree that we are never going to get to a point where things are not concerning. Um, and really, I guess my issue with it was um, at the last meeting, there was a, a very big uh, point made about any changes at this point would need to be discussed with parents, people given the option to adjust their uh, choices based on the changes. Um, so we were not going to consider making any changes and then a bunch of changes that nobody got any um, consult on or any option to change. So that was really my point with it. But I mean, we are where we are. And so, you know, there's no need to really belabor that point. My other question. Uh, yeah, I do think it's hard belaboring. Dr. Just for we said over and over again, that we would give parents the option for virtual learning or in-person learning. We said over and over again, we would do our best to make sure that students who chose, parents who chose uh, virtual learning, we would do our best to match them with teachers from their schools. None of that has changed. Not one, not one part of that conversation has changed. Parents will still have the option for their child to stay virtual, and parents will still have the option for their child to come face to face. And we have done our best to match students with their homeschool teachers in both of those environments. And what, what the only thing that's changed is that we didn't do it centrally because we wanted to we wanted to get the scheduling process done. And what happened, quite candidly, was we hit the ground running and we realized within about 30 minutes of hitting the ground running with our principals that it was going to be too complicated a task to be able to make happen the way we talked about making it happen. And that we needed to pivot, do it this way, and give ourselves the time to be ready to open school on September the 8th, and then be able to be ready to open school face-to-face -face within two weeks. So, so I just want to say that. So it wasn't, because it, it feels like, and I don't think it's your intention, Ms. Owens, but from some of the other comments we've gotten, it feels like people think we tried to pull a fast one on them. And I just want to be sure people understand that's not what happened. That your child will still have a virtual environment. We said and we've honored and we, we're going to continue to try to honor that we, your child will have a homeschool teacher in that virtual environment if it's enti entirely possible. In those cases where it's not, we'll shift them to this kind of central um, system. And, and so, so we didn't uh, pull a fast one on folks. We, we responded to kind of the moment. And, uh, and I do apologize. And, and Dr. Robertson's also you know, indicated he takes responsibility, but at the end of the day, we all take responsibility for that because it's a decision we made together. And um, we're sorry if it created anxiety, but we also think it's a good solution 
and will honor what we said we were going to do. And Ms. Owens, if I could add one more thing. You know, what we also said a couple of weeks ago, we recognize circumstances and families are going to change based upon the pandemic. And so we are always going to do our very best to honor uh, a parent choice to change their child's environment based upon new circumstances that occur. Just like if we have a staff member who has a circumstance change. I mean, we want to we want to do everything we can to meet the needs of all students. Uh, in all families and so we will be flexible to the to, to again the greatest extent possible thank you my other question is um in regards to, to meals and meal pickup um in looking at the uh schedules uh with the synchronous learning and looking at the uh timing for meal pickup um, and th this is a conversation that I've already um, kind of got to start with uh, Mr. Freeman and uh, I forget, I'm drawing a blank on uh, who I talked with Mr. Freeman today. Um, but when we're looking at the synchronous learning and the meal pickup time, um, my understanding is that it's not locked in yet, but that we are kind of looking at a window of afternoon time, like a 1030 to 130, perhaps. And I, I want to make sure that I put out there um, that I hope that we'll consider having an earlier morning pickup that the current plan doesn't seem to allow for children to eat breakfast. Um, and it really creates some challenges for parents that are struggling to have one uh, person home to work with the child virtually to then, I can't leave the house and not take the child with me. If I have a child under the age of nine or 10 to go pick up their meal. So now they're missing that synchronous time because the only time for picking up meals is scheduled during the synchronous learning time. Yeah, so what Ms. Owens is describing, she called and she asked some questions earlier today and uh, had a discussion with Dr. Smith, uh, Director for Food Services. So. There's some uh, some pre-draft information that was shared just to to go through the discussion. So that information still needs to be vetted by our staff uh, before it's shared. They're valid comments. They're uh, things that we're very concerned about. Um, so we will continue to work through those and then uh, come back with uh, more information to be distributed to the community. Anything um, that we step into, everything we're doing is with a continuous process improvement mindset. So anything that we go into, if we don't get it just right as we implement it, we're going to look to make improvements as we go on. I think just to add on to the food distribution conversation, just to make the community aware, uh, if, and if you're not, um, so things have changed pretty dramatically since, since the spring and into the summer in terms of the USDA guidelines relative to how we can distribute meals during this pandemic so mm -hmm. in the spring and in the summer there were considerable relaxation of the regulations concerning meal distribution mm -hmm. um, so you know when you're dealing with free and reduced lunch a student has to be identified they have to show up they have a student number we're able to connect the student number to the student and therefore provide that meal and we have an entire record keeping system devoted to that um, and those regulations were, were relaxed considerably um, and into the summer the summer feeding program allows us to feed any child up to the age of 18 who shows up at a site without having to have any of those um, um, sort of forms in place. Um, the USDA has, has indicated that as of the first day of school, which for us is September 8th, we return to the processes which existed pre-pandemic, which means anybody who needs a meal has to be free and reduced lunch eligible. They have to come up to school. Student has to be present, have to have the student number. We have to go through the same process we do under normal circumstances. We have been advocating for, you should know, we have been advocating for here, we've been advocating through the consortium um, and uh, through the National School Superintendents Association to, um, to get the flexibility back. I know um, Congressman Bobby Scott um, is on the committee that uh, oversees the school lunch program for Congress and they've reached out to USDA, that committee, and they've been working to get them to relax those and so our community 
um, has interest in that, I certainly would encourage our community to reach out either to the USDA or to Congressman Scott and ask him to please keep pressing the issue because it's an important issue in terms of our ability to serve meals to our students in our community and to do so in ways that are more flexible than than what may otherwise be allowed. I just thought it was important that we at least add that on for your understanding. I agree. Thank you. Um, and actually, I got a really good explanation of that during uh, my conversation earlier. So that that was helpful. And I'm, I am excited about some of the possibilities that are um, coming forward with the, the meal distribution. I'm hoping that uh, the plan will be in a position that we are ready to get it out to the public very soon, because I, I do think that it's going to take parents some time to adjust to another app, another process, and for them to start making arrangements for how these meals are going to be picked up and, and brought to their, their homes during the synchronous learning time. Um, and so the sooner that that information can get out, the sooner that parents can start um, getting their, their support groups together and who's going to pick up lunches for these five children and how they're going to work that out. So. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, are we good for now, Ms. Owens? Yep, yeah, thank you. All right, so right. Mrs. Manning and then Mrs. Weems. Yeah, so I'd like to shed some light on the issues that you all were just talking about a little while ago about you were confused why parents um, were thinking that there were going to be changes made and that it was going to be on the agenda. Um, I received this email last night from a parent. The subject is, please do not amend the plan says, Dear Mrs. Manning, I received this email from a school board member earlier today. And that email says, At the 811 school board meeting, two amendments were proposed. I voted against both of them. However, at tomorrow's meeting, I believe an amendment to revisit the first nine online will be offered. Now I'm unsure how, of how I will vote. So right there is exactly how it got out to the public um, and why the public um, thought that there was going to be an amendment and a change to the plans this evening. Um, so my question is um, about the academic uh, foundations class and to um, specifically some of the special needs, the students with special needs that are going to be coming back, um, perhaps in the red yellow metric, I believe is what was said. Um, how are we getting the word out to those families that that is being offered? Because I, I spoke to a parent of a student in academic foundations class um, just this Sunday, and they were not aware of that. Thank you, Mrs. Manning. No, those parents have not been made aware that those um, plans are being made because those plans um, have really just recently been decided. But as our um, staff hold IEP meetings, they, they will certainly be contacting families and who have uh, selected option one uh, to let them know that, that we are certainly planning for them to return. So that now there's so when do you I mean do you think that's going to be in the next couple of days? Couple yes. Of, okay. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Yep. Done for now, Mrs. Manning. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Weems. Are you with us? Are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to say, you know, Dr. Spence and all the decision makers, thank you so much for um staying the course. Um, you have from the from the get go given parents and teachers um, the option to teach and or learn virtually or face to face when it's safe to do so. And thank you, Dr. Spence, for sharing your confidence and your commitment again tonight um, for getting these students back in school face to face as soon as it's safe to do so. I really appreciate that. I also was led to believe by several colleagues and um, people in the community that that um, a couple of my board members were gonna bring up um, another vote tonight. So I just wanna say colleagues, thank you for reconsidering that because I think that the best thing to do is to move forward and to do what we've done tonight, spend you know four hours answering questions of, um, of us and of the community. And we did that in the workshop and we're doing that right now. So I just thank my colleagues for, for reconsidering that and not putting that up for another vote tonight. Um, I do have a question, Dr. Spence, with the um, safe learning. Okay, now I've just dripped on a blank. What are we calling them? The safe learning, yeah, um, the safe learning places for the for the students. Have the teachers are, and employees, have they already signed up for that? Do we know exactly what the numbers, what's the deadline? 
And if I'm a teacher and I teach in building A and my do my children go to school in building B, do I have the option to drop them off at B or to take them to building A with me or to take them to either of the buildings and then go back home and teach from my home? How does that work? How is that going to work? So, so my answer is we're working back. Details and so teachers haven't been notified of this yet, but Dr. Bergen, do you want to lay in? Because I know you've been working closely on this project. Yeah, we just sent you board members a, a courtesy heads up that we'd be contacting employees. We had not contacted the employees when we notified you. We've heard you say how frustrating it is for you to be the last ones to hear of something. So we made sure you were the first to hear. Um, that was that that feels like that was 48 hours ago. So we have been working furiously to communicate directly with our employees who will be staffing the safe learning centers as well as the teachers who will be taking advantage of enrolling their children in the safe learning centers. Um, lots of communications are being created this week. More communications next week. We are feverishly trying to be in place for the 8th of September in coordination with Parks and Rec as well for the 8th of September. But the intent, Mrs. Okay. Wayne, the intent is teachers would be able to bring children to the school where they work, as well as the, the classified staff who work there. So if, if I am a bus driver or a general uh, assistant and I have been uh, given this alternative assignment while we're in a period of virtual instruction and I have, I have a child at home who is a second grader, I would have first priority because the program can't run without me. So I come to the virtual learning center with my child so that I can help watch other staff members' children. Did that address your question, okay. Mrs. Williams? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, thank you. And um, I'll look forward to some more details, obviously, when, when y'all get them. And I just think that, um, you know, like I think Dr. Robertson said it and Dr. Spence also, you know, the ones of us who have children, I mean, I had children going through the school system for, you know, 31 straight years and now a granddaughter. And there's always glitches. and you know, it's never perfect at first. I mean, even on, even when everything in the universe is perfect, you know, some, there's a glitch in the buses. Your child had this teacher and that last minute the numbers changed. And so your child has another teacher that they didn't expect, nor did they want to have. And um, so I just think with this, it, we just got to have grace, you know, administrators, teachers, parents, students, just give everybody grace and, and take a deep breath. We're going to do it and it, it's not going to be perfect, but it will get done. And, and if we just show, show grace and patience, it, it'll help a long ways. So I look forward to, to getting it done. And, and thank you again, um, Dr. Spence and, and colleagues for moving forward with this. So is that it, Mrs. Weems? No question? <laughs> I, I asked a question. It was already answered. Did start with one. Okay. Decent. Okay, Mrs. Hughes and then Mrs. Riggs. Okay. Um, I, actually, just a little bit ago, there, a parent um, sent in an email, and I think I know the answer to this, but is there a cap on students in a room once they're in there, or is it just that's going to vary by the size of the room? Is that for... The like just general classrooms when we bring students back to school. Yes, just general. It's going to vary a little bit. We're okay. we're shooting for class sizes about twenty, based on the size of our rooms. Uh, but some rooms we're going to have larger rooms. We're going to be able to have more children in there because again, it really comes down to how keeping that three foot distance is what we're looking to accomplish. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mrs. Riggs, you're on. Um, yeah, I got a, a question from a, a teacher that said something about the bus drivers were told about the the learning center. What are you calling it, Dr. Dr. Yeah, yeah, the Safe Learning Center. Okay, but the teacher assistants haven't been told about it. So some some assistants have, and other assistants have not. Okay, and the reason for that is because. Some teacher assistant groups, for example, our special education assistants will be engaged during virtual learning with students. And some of the other some of the other assistant groups will be engaged during virtual learning. So, for example, like security assistants, we had a long conversation about them. And what we determined was that, by and large, most of them are going to be engaged either in training because there's a bunch of renewed training that has to occur for that group or in working in the buildings because the buildings will still be open. 
And so, um, so the assistant groups who we, we are asking to work in the safe learning centers, we are contacting them. They are being contacted, but not everybody will be contacted. Okay, but you are in the process of contacting the process them. of contacting the ones who will need to work. And one other question, uh, librarians, what kind of um, communication have you had with them? Generally librarians, or are you talking about library media assistants? The librarians, the, the, media, the media specialists, you know, the ones that are taking care of the libraries. How much information have they received? So the, the uh, LMS has had the same opportunity to uh, note their preference. Uh -huh. And so working through uh, employee relations, all schools have received a list in tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, where tier one being the staff who have the highest documented concerns. We wanna make sure no matter what, we keep them in a, in a virtual environment. And you could be an LMS in that first tier. And so that's factored into, um, their their job placement. Yep. Okay, we're close to winding down. Mrs. Anderson. I just want to say thank you <clears throat> to the administration for coming up with these uh, the safe learning center idea and for um, thinking of the teachers who are now considered essential staff, <laughs> uh, essential personnel. Um, I, I think this is this goes a long way to showing that we, we do appreciate our teachers and that we are giving them consideration. I, I, we, we, I first heard of this idea last spring and I had some teachers um, uh, emailing me and saying that, you know, this is the least we could do when they were trying to, they were trying to, you know, work, teach virtually. And, and so they talked about, you know, if we had to go virtually, this is something that they were, that they asked that we might consider. And I appreciate that there's been a lot of work in going into this and thinking it through. And so I appreciate all that, that you've done in, in considering that. Um, uh, being that I'm a former teacher myself, I really appreciate the consideration that you're giving to staff. Uh, last, that seems to be it for the queue for this, this session. The, the only added comment I'd like to make, just uh, kind of an appeal to my colleagues, that, I mean, we all recognize, and I've said it in, in many of the email replies, you know, respecting the, diff, the different opinions within the community. And those different opinions aren't going to disappear, but if, if we can model through our behavior, just keeping and being respectful of these different opinions, because there's no right or wrong position on this. And, Again, that we just hope that uh, as a community, this board is seen as and division is make moving ahead responsibly. I mean, we have Dr. Fauci citing our metrics and the CDC citing, you know, ways to close the school, uh, doing it t targeted, not necessarily all at once. I mean, there's multiple examples like that. So, so with that, thank you, staff, for. Bearing with us with all these questions that we know will benefit the public as much as us, and just appreciate appreciate it so much. Doctor Spence, anything for you before we move on? Okay. All right. So that brings us to standing committee reports for those committees that have met. Is are there any reports? Mr. Edwards. Well, the <coughs> audit committee will meet Thursday afternoon in here. Anybody else? Okay, hearing none, uh, we're concluding this formal meeting at 9.34, and we will be uh, moving on to the next section once we hearing of citizens on non-agenda. She didn't restart.